Okay. All righty. So it is now 7.04 and we're going into open session, item 4.0. And we begin with aid the flag salute. So pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. B, we'll go on to roll call. And uh, board member Arianas? Present. Board member Greer? Here. Board member Rodriguez-Pena? Here. And board member Cruz-Gonzalez? Here. Okay, so everybody is here. So we will move on to approval of the agenda, item 4.1. Do I have a motion on the floor? I want to uh, make a, ask a question before we approve the agenda. Um, since we did receive a letter from the city of Azusa with concerns about the action item on the EIR, um, is that something we want to pull or um, or maybe tape? So I don't I, you know if I'm either suggesting an amendment to the agenda to remove that item for the next board meeting, or whether we just keep the item and and just and just discuss it because if we keep it i'm going to make a motion to table it yeah that's what that's what i'm thinking uh gabriella i, I agree madam president I, I think we uh need to remove this item and okay. um be able to uh, discuss this further if right. so i make a motion i make a motion to, i make a motion to approve the agenda removing item i don't have the item number in front of me um does somebody have it yeah the uh, item is uh 9.3 9 Item 9.3 for the next for the next board meeting that we have the next regular um, I'm not going to say next next to a to a future board meeting um, yes. so I, I make the motion to approve the agenda without that item. I second. Okay, so it was a motion by uh, Board Member Cruz Gonzalez, seconded by Board Member Arianes. Um, any other comments? Yeah, maybe just discussion. I, so we can we can take that route, and and I have similar feelings as well, but I, but I think that. Um, having time to, to even discuss aspects of it may be, may be helpful. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm landing in the same boat as, as everyone else, but um, mm -hmm. so I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I would be in favor of still discussing it since it's on the agenda. So I'm just, uh, so since we don't have legal counsel here and I'm not really sure with implications, we don't deal with EIRs on a regular basis and there's certain legal steps you take. I just don't want to put an agenda item um, when we don't have legal counsel giving us advice on what, how that impacts the timeline that we currently have. That's the only reason I suggest we remove it so that that way, uh, and it's just, I mean, I could be wrong, but I'd rather be careful and not be wrong. I agree. Okay. Just as a point of clarification, uh, we can definitely table it, uh, but we do have uh, we do plan on having legal counsel here for that agenda item correct today correct oh okay well then i'll so then um i'll 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 remove my amendment for now um so that we can just keep it on the agenda item for discussion gabby are you okay with that if we yes. keep it on the agenda i okay. was actually going to ask for legal counsel to be present so, so okay so can i so that was that mean uh would you change the action and and have it for info or um how, how does that work i think we can we can make that decision at that agenda yeah, item i agree yeah. so i make a motion to approve the agenda as is okay motion by and second by board member ariana and we'll go ahead and vote oh gosh um, I can't. It logged me out. Okay, because we don't. Okay, it logged me out. Vote. I have to log back in. Okay, we're gonna... hand vote. All righty, five zero for approval of the agenda. Okay, so now we will move on to item 5.0, items from the floor, public comment on agenda and non-agenda items. This is the opportunity for the public to address the board on non-agenda items. No action can be taken on non-agenda items. Individual speakers may be allowed up to three minutes to address the board agenda on any non-agenda item. 
Prior to addressing the board, please fill out the request to speak card, public comment blue card, and submit it to the board secretary. And do we have any? So if you would like to comment, please raise your hand. And I believe we have one already. Do we have any? So if you would like to comment, please raise your hand. And I believe we have one already. Do we have any? So if you would like to comment, please raise your hand. Okay, we have Mr. Manuel uh, Munoz, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, good evening, President and board members of the Azusa Unified School District. On behalf of the city of Azusa, uh, we submitted a letter today in regards to item uh, 9.3 for the resolution of 19-20-56. The city is requesting for the item not um, to be pushed to a later date. So uh, our city has more information on the item as far as the staff report and whatnot. So we can properly comment on the item itself. Um, also just knowing the, um, the intentions and so forth of um, getting that exemption from the zoning. And that's it for um, the comment. Okay, thank you very much, Manuel, Mr. Munoz. Okay, anybody else? Any other people want to speak? I don't see anyone else. Oh, let's see. Uh, no, that's it. Okay, seeing none, uh, we're going to go to 6.0, comments and requests by the board. Board member Arianas, do you have any comments or? Can you please come back to me? I'm trying to join yes. the meeting. Definitely. Thank you. Okay, uh, board member Greer. Hey, good good evening, everybody. Um, just just a couple couple of things. Um, one. I um, want to reiterate again my, my uh, intentions to have coffee online kind of, kind of appointments and meetings once a month uh, moving forward. And so uh, this month will be in uh, uh, two days on Thursday um, at six o'clock. And so I've shared some of that on my um, Facebook uh, page if, if people want to click and there, there's a link to sign up there. Uh, otherwise, feel free to reach out, out to me. You can send me an email or, or, uh, and whatnot, and I can, I can help get you, um, uh, send you the link to, to sign up for that. But that'll be happening this Thursday at six o'clock. And again, um, everyone is invited. And, and again, I'll, I'll just throw it out there to um, any, any of my colleagues that um, I think it has been extremely beneficial um, up, up to this point with just a couple that I've done. And um, if there's any way that I can be of, of, of assistance, if, if you'd like to, to, to do um, one of your own, I, I'd be more than, more than happy to help um, show you what I've done and, and, and you have the opportunity to, to build upon that. Um, only other thing that I wanna uh, address and talk about is, um, so we're we're all aware, and, and um, Sheila, and you you made mention of this last last uh, week at our last board meeting. We're we're all well aware of of um, the the attention that has has been drawn to um, like racial injustice, um, and, and and you know, and how how this has played out in, in our country, and 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 even you know the kind of the, the impetus for a lot of that attention was the the killing of George Floyd, and. Um, I know that we received an email from from a, a, a very impassioned student who shared you know some some of her thoughts and her reflections you know on, on that and and so I, I guess I just want to comment on it on it briefly to say that um, first of all I'm 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 grateful to see the um, like like the the passion and and folks who are who are are, are recognizing a need to look at this and, and for people that sit at tables like we do um, where we can make decisions um, to. To ensure that that we're, we're minimizing and and if not entirely eliminating, you know some of those injustices and bias, biases that happen, you know in, in our areas of, of supervision and, and and oversight, and so um, I know that that was requested, uh, Sheila Neen, uh, to, that we talk about it at this particular uh, meeting, and I, I don't see that on the the agenda, um, but I would I I just want to co comment publicly and second that 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 uh, not even one conversation that's probably a series of conversations that that we would um, need to have. Um, to, to make it clear where, where we stand. I, I'll share just for myself personally, um, 
somebody who has firsthand experiences with, you know, with, with, with some of these uh, kinds of things and issues. Um, I, uh, I'm used to, a lot of times I'm used to being that guy who talks about those things. Um, and, and when I bring those things up, people tend not to be surprised that I'm talking about those, those things. And that's kind of a, 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 a mantle and a burden that I've willingly carried. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful um, to see that there are, are other people who are recognizing that this is not um, an issue for one segment of the population, but that this is, this is uh, it, it, an issue and thing, you know, something for us all to look at. Um, as a district, as a community, um, as as a as a nation, um, and so uh, just want to want to reiterate that and, and communicate yeah. that forward publicly. And, and can we go ahead and make sure we get that on the agenda, our total? All right, thank you, uh, Board Member Arianas. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to our Azusa Unified School District meeting. Um, now we're in summer session. And um, I wanna thank the teachers, administrators, and, uh, and staff at the district for, I know the year's not over, but we're now in summer session. So thank you for communicating when parents can come and uh, get their meals, which is on Wednesdays, correct? From 8.30 to 10.30, is that correct? Okay, um, just wanna throw that out there. And, um, and I also wanted to, to uh, Thank Adrian, um, first of all, for uh, uh, speaking and sharing your, um, you know, uh, about meeting with, with uh, having coffee with a school board member. Um, I actually would like to do one um, and I'm looking to do one in July. Um, I still don't have a date yet. I, I have to check my calendar and make sure that um, I'm able to do it. And a, um, I, so I'm throwing it out there. As soon as I have a date, I will go ahead and share it with the community and with our board. Um, and um, I also wanted to thank Shinaline for bringing uh, uh, just uh, the conversation of us speaking about uh, you know, the racial inequalities. And also what I would like to do is, um, if possible, uh, talk about ethnic studies. Um, I think that's something that we have not as a board, you know, uh, have brought up to the table and we have not been able to bring a resolution. Um, we are one of the districts that does not have a resolution in California. And I would like to go ahead and have that discussion publicly and, um, and bring that to our school district to have a resolution. So uh, Madam President, if we can go ahead and have that discussion as well, um, that would That be sounds great. fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, board member Rodriguez Pena. Yes, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to congratulate um, Paramount Elementary, uh, the principal and his staff for um, making the top Los Angeles County public school list for closing opportunity gaps for low, com low income Latino students in both English and in math. Kudos to Paramount Elementary. And I also joined the labor management initiative workshop today. And um, this is the first time I, I've ever participated in, in this workshop. But you know, what I, I, I got from it was that, um, you know, we need to start using, you know, um, we, not us. Yep. Also, like unions, they, they talked about, which I, I thought was really important, you know, we say our union partners, instead of the same union, because Sometimes, I mean, even uh, I'll admit they'll say, you know, the board members, just sometimes like people are like, oh my gosh, you know, we're, we're all in this together. But um, the words I got out of it was partnership, collaboration, communication, transparency, relationships, stakeholders, which include school board members, administration, staff, um, union partners, parents, and students. It's really important that whenever we, we, we're having discussions or, or we want to make a, a difference or a change in, in our school, we should include all the stakeholders that, um, that are also, you know, um, in the school sites or the parents that are bringing their students to school or the students that have to go to school in that same environment. So, um, and, and we need to listen, you know, listen to, to their ideas. And, and I'm proud to say though, as this a unified school district, you know, we are, we do use these models, but I think we need to continue it and, you know, even, be even stronger on it. And, and that's kind of what I, I'm, I'm excited to go to part two tomorrow, but this is one that I did go to. So speaking of partnerships, I want to thank the uh, city of Azusa 
Mayor Gonzalez and the City Council for their partnership in recognizing our high school seniors. How important that was for our high school seniors to be recognized with yard signs, banners. Um, they had their, um, with their names in front of the city hall where they would see them highlighted. And um, also um, Mayor Gonzalez and the city council on the cable channel, they, they, they thanked the students or, or, or they spoke uh, on graduation. And uh, la just last week, they allowed three high school students to go and speak up there. And the, 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 young, the three young ladies did a fabulous job, but I, I wanna thank back to partnerships that we have that partnership that we're working together. Thank you. Hey, board member Cruz Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of things. Um, I do want to say I didn't attend the Labor Management Institute, but I want to say I really appreciate that um, that all of our all of our bargaining units, so the teachers, our adult ed, and classified, all all went with our district staff. I think it's a very important first step. Um, I really believe collaboration is the key to improving student outcomes and having all of us keep our focus on students and student needs and student outcomes, I think, makes us all stronger and thinking about it from that perspective. So I think I, I'm really glad that we that some of that you were able to attend and we and that a board member was able to attend. And I hope that as we as they we move forward, we find opportunities to stay connected with that, because I think that's really important training for us um, and a space for us to do some planning and thinking. So thank you for that. Um, and the, uh, I think connected to that, because I think you cannot have hard conversations without built, built with trusted relationships um, and collaboration. And so I, I want to say I appreciate um, Adrian and Gabriela for, for echoing and or for, you know, also saying that you want to talk about systemic racism and some of these issues in our educational system. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you both hit upon really I mean, hit important issues, right? Ethnic studies is a key component, making sure we have culturally responsive um, education opportunities for kids from preschool to 12, right? And so I think this is a great time for us to have this conversation and to have it with that assets framework as opposed to just a, you know let's let's try to address the issue let's have let's let's figure out what we need to do to change the system so i appreciate that i look forward to having that conversation um, um connected to that um is is this issue about sros and so i won't put that on the table right at the beginning i think i want us to have a really a focus on moving forward how we can move forward but i do want to share just a little historical perspective because i, I was able to hear a podcast last week um Two things struck me actually. Um, there was on NPR there was a um, there was a piece about some about race riots that happened in Chicago in the in the teens it, a, a century ago. So I think it was 1918 or 1919, right? And so the woman the woman there was talking about after that they put together a panel. They had a whole task force. It came out with recommendations, and her response was like. You would you would be shocked because the recommendations they were putting out in 1918 or 1919 are the same things we're talking about today. So I, I think it just goes to show that I think I, I really hope that we are going to go beyond just words and rhetoric and nice piece, you know nice things on a piece of paper and really think about how do we change um, what what we do. Um, and the second piece that I want to mention is um, I heard I was able to hear a podcast around just the history of how police ended up in schools. Um, and it's very interesting, right? Because it's directly tied to this, what we, you know, as we talk about systemic racism, because it started with desegregation, right? And so when there's in, in, in cities like, big cities like Boston, Chicago, um, when they're having issues, they send in the police and the police actually focus on, on the black students, not the white students in their families. So that's sort of how police start entering schools. In LA, in LA Unified, it actually started with the, with the Chicano blowout. Right, so when the kids walked out because they wanted to demand access to a, a college education, um, they sent the police in, and that. So we, so as we talk about, we think about undoing the pieces that we think maybe exist in our system. I think we really have to be cognizant only of history, but also be willing to be brave around trying to undo some things that we feel maybe we're attached to, but really, I mean, are really not there to think in. Are not they're there because they're maybe vestiges of of, of of past practices and not because that's what's best for our students in today's society. So I just want to put that on the table. I could probably you can tell I could go on about this forever. Um, but I but I appreciate that we're having this conversation and I'm really hopeful that that um, that some great things are going to come out of it. So thank you. And I'd like to jump on top of that too. I come from a background from the south. On one side of my family, I was a child of the help. And I have pictures of me and my nanny and us growing up together. And I always wondered when I was older why she paid so much attention to me. And once I saw the history of it, I understood. 
And then on my father's side, they worked with the migrant farmers out in uh, Corona in the fields. And so they were for the Okies. And so I have an understanding from a different perspective, but I agree that this does need, I mean, we've gone through it so many times in the 60s, in the 90s, I got pulled over for giving a black friend a ride home from work because his wife needed to borrow the car. They pulled him out of my car, roughed him up and asked me if my husband knew I had a black man in my car. And so these kind of instances still happening is ridiculous. So I'm on board with all this. And um, I would like to make, moving on to something else, uh, making an announcement since we already did the thing with the elections and we will be having elections in November. I will not be running. Uh, my grandchildren have decided they want their grandmother when I first started. I had two grandchildren, four kids. Now I have seven grandchildren and everybody has spouses and I, they, they need my time. So it has been wonderful working with all of you. And I see a dynamic that's growing and improving this school board. So let's hopefully we can continue to do so, but I will be in the sidelines. So, uh, okay, we will go ahead and move on. Uh, now we are at comments 7.0, comments and reports from the cabinet and superintendent. Comments, yeah, and report with the cabinet and superintendent. And following tradition, I will start. Hi, I'm Madam President, um, Board of Education, Cabinet, Community. Um, it's an honor to be here um, as, a, uh, as your HR person. Um, uh, Jerry, I want to start off by congratulating you. I know it was a big announcement. Um, I want to express my appreciation for your work as a board member. Um, it's been impactful. Um, I also want to uh, share out regarding um, the labor management uh, initiative. Um, I participated for the first time in that uh, uh, summit. I uh, started today and it continues through tomorrow. Um, it is a partnership where we had all our labor partners present, uh, representatives from AEA, um, AFA, and CSEA, along with members from management. And we had uh, board members also present, uh, board members uh, uh, Rodriguez Pena and board member uh, Arianes was also present, so I want to thank you all. Um, and it's important to stress the goals of the summit, which is to strengthen the relationship between uh, management and um, labor. Uh, it's incredibly important, especially as we enter these uncertain times um, around uh, the reopening of schools. Um, we live in, in these really challenging um, times, and so um, really, in order for us to um, move forward, it's important for us to be working together and strengthening that, strengthening that relationship. Um, there was a couple of slides that were shared early on that really resonated with me, um, and um, I look forward to continuing that work with each of our partners uh, collectively and also individually um, as we as we work to strengthen the relationship. Um, I also want to share that. Um, board member uh, Cruz Gonzalez, sure she wasn't there uh, to participate, but she was there um, and uh, we were graced by her presence as she represented our, um, the CSBA organization as the president of CSBA. So um, where I say it, it's very, it's, 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 I'm very proud to be able to associate with, with just some awesome um, um, superstars that are at the state level, just, I mean, from carrying that, that flag and really uh, advocating for students and school districts. So thank you for your, your work in, in that regard. Um, and, and with that, I, um, I again, want to end by saying that I appreciate the work that we're doing. Um, it's, it's been quite a bit of, uh, of work in these, these times, but um, it's one thing uh, is certain we've come together as a, as a team um, to really, to really kind of, uh, address these really difficult um, issues that we have in front of us. So thank you. All right, I will go next. So good evening, board. I uh, wanted to share that this will be my last board meeting. And I truly wanted to thank you as a board for entrusting in me uh, these last three years as your CBO and welcoming me 
to the district five years ago. You, you did put a lot of trust to put me in this position. And I hope that um, I've done everything that, that could make you proud of transitioning the, the business department into a well-running machine. Um, it would not have been possible without the great leadership of Dr. Kaminsky. She believed in me. She um, pushed me to be better. Um, and so I, I owe her a, a debt of gratitude for truly believing in me and supporting me and um, making me uh, the CBO that I am today. Um, and I've, I've had an amazing team. Uh, I, I've said it a thousand times, probably not in this public forum, but our cabinet team truly has an open relationship where we can really address any issue. And that is a rarity. Um, it's something that I look forward to every single day in, in mm -hmm. solving the issues, making Azusa better for our kids and our families, making our schools more desirable every single day. Um, but I did not do it alone. Um, I worked closely with our labor partners and I'm gonna call you guys by name, but Meg and Yvonne, I, I truly owe you a debt of gratitude for how much trust you put into me and uh, believing in me that, that we could work together to make things work for our group, for our district and for our kids. Um, you guys were amazing partners in this and we've overcome so many obstacles over the last three years and our collaboration has truly made the district better. Um, and and my, my directors that really do the, the real work. Um, they, they tell me where to be and what to do. <laughs> so truly appreciate them. You know, Megna um, coming in right with me. She is an amazing fiscal director. She has great potential. I, I believe one day she will be an amazing CBO. Um, tonight, for example, we're presenting a budget based off of numbers that we were able to pull together from um, snippets of information that have come out piecemeal. Um, that is unheard of that you could put together a budget in a matter of hours. Um, to Darren, who I don't know if you know, but the, the guy works 24 seven. He works seven days a week and he never goes home. Um, the district is blessed to have him and I was blessed to have him on my team. He's, he's been a rock, somebody that I call um, in the middle of the night and he's ready. And to Maria, who's new to our team, um, who's been asked to do so much with such, such little um, tools this last year as we look to bring nutrition services within mm -hmm. uh, a reasonable budget. Um, I know we've asked a ton of you and I really appreciate all you've done to implement um, the plans that we had laid out and to, to be able to work with your staff to figure out new ways of becoming more efficient and reinventing the department. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, a, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to work with all of you and I will truly miss our relationships. I, I am, I, it's so hard to leave, it really is. Um, but I am not going far, I am going next door. And so again, as I always had with, when I was in the district, I had an open door, the same will exist. Anything that the district needs, I will be more than happy to support. Thank you. Uh, so uh, congratulations uh, to both Jerry and Mark. Um, your imprint um, in Azusa um, will live on. Uh, you've done a lot for, uh, for the kids, uh, for the students, the families in the community and the staff. And so I appreciate that uh, immensely on behalf of them and um, wish you obviously the very, the very best. Um, as you might know, we are in full swing uh, with summer program uh, we just launched. And so we're really excited about that. 
Uh, but just wanted to just take the opportunity really quick to just uh, share some some numbers around our distance learning that uh, came to a close with promotions and graduations and the end of the school year. Um, our TOSA team, uh, prior to launching our distance learning, uh, offered close to 100 synchronous professional learning opportunities in a virtual manner uh, for our teachers and our administrators um, here in Azusa. Our teachers attended multiple professional learning, job alikes, one-on-one -on -one opportunities, grade level alikes, content alikes uh, to get ready for the launch of distance learning, which seems like a long time ago now. Uh, our classified staff fielded over 4,000 phone calls and emails from families regarding technology needs. Our classified staff made over 3,000 appointments for families to pick up Chromebooks and they distributed over 5,000 Chromebooks. Additionally, our sites in a combination of certificated, classified, and administration made over 3,500 3, outreach calls to families in the pursuit of connecting our students to be successful in distance learning. And so I just wanted to thank, as we close that, that uh, particular chapter, I uh, wanted to thank everyone uh, for their commitments and what they did uh, to make distance learning the best that it could be, obviously given the opportunity that was presented to us in such a quick manner. I want to echo uh, Yolanda's comment and uh, give a huge congratulation to the Param Paramount community for once again being named a top Los Angeles County Public School for closing the opportunity gap for low-income Latinx students in both English and math. A round of applause to the teachers who have implemented intervention systems of support and who uh, uh, incorporate collaborative practices uh, to the classified staff that supports the academic achievements of the school, to Antonio Flores, the principal, uh, for leading from a mindset of support and continuous improvement. And finally, of course, to the community for their partnership with the school. Together, uh, this, this recognition is for them. I also want to thank uh, our partners in AFA, AEA, CSCA, and administrators uh, and board members, uh, all of whom attended the Labor Management Initiative uh, virtual summit day today. Um, I'm going to take a page out of Yolanda's uh, book and uh, also share some words uh, and thoughts that stuck that really struck me. Uh, this whole idea of partnerships, of collaborative tools of learning, of team building, and of change, I think uh, was a great way to launch uh, today. And so I, I just think what a grand opportunity to be able to experience this together as a team. And I look forward uh, to the outcomes from this process. Um, and then to put a cherry on the top, uh, Jorge shared that um, our very own Shilonin uh, was on a video. And I want to thank her for on the video, giving a shout out to Azusa. So uh, thank you so much uh, for your presence and your work in that space uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, you are on mute. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to 8.0 report action of closed session matters. There is nothing to report. So we'll move on to 9.0, general functions, 9.1, COVID-19 operations written report. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I've invited uh, Jennifer Edith Bryan, who has been who has taken the lead on this. Uh, Jen? Hi. Hello, everybody. Good evening, uh, President Bibles Vogel, board members. Uh, and to public as well as they join us. I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, on your agenda tonight for your action is the COVID-19 operations written report. And I'd like to provide you in our community a little bit of information about this document um, before you take your vote. So uh, a little over a month ago, uh, our governor issued executive order N5620. And what this executive order did was it uh, postponed the LCAP. This is normally the time when we bring the LCAP to you for approval. Um, and, but it postponed that at the 2021 LCAP to December 15th and then required districts across the state to develop a COVID-19 operations written report. 
And this report was to cover all of the activities that went on during uh, the COVID-19 closures of schools this spring, cover some designated specific areas. It is a, a, an item that is to be submitted to the board for approval and then submitted July 1st along with our district budget to the county. The audience for this document is really our community. Um, and it is then supposed to be and will be shared publicly um, in various ways. One will be our, our website um, and then uh, some other ways, which I'll tell you about in a minute. One of the, the other components I wanna tell you about as we, we put this report together is that we really had input from our PAC Plus. During the school closures, our PAC Plus continued to meet and support uh, the district in decision-making. And one of those uh, decisions was around this document. They provided some uh, really good input and feedback, which led to changes in the draft, um, and then provided great ideas about how publicly to share this. They were really excited about making sure um, stakeholders in the Azusa community heard about what happened as our schools went through this spring pandemic and, and what we did. And so they came up with some great ideas that we're going to be using to publicly share this document. So I want to tell you just a, a little bit about the areas that are covered in it. You do have copies attached to your board agenda item, and, and those copies are in English and Spanish. Um, there are some main areas, as I mentioned, that were to be covered. And one was what, what were the major changes to programs and that occurred during, uh, during the COVID-19 closures, and, and what impacts did they have on our students and families? and staff. And so in the document, you'll read about uh, some of the professional learning. Uh, Arturo just mentioned some of the great opportunities to help our teachers who were working very hard to, to, to implement the distance, distance learning block schedule plan and to use technology and through Team TOSA and all of their outreach and opportunities, we're able to provide a lot of virtual distance learning, collaboration time, PLC time. We had a huge change and uptick in our communications department. The superintendent sent community updates twice a week, tons of outreach with uh, phone, email, texting for students, as you heard from, from the district level, from the school levels, teachers, administrators, reaching out and supporting families, including our dedicated helpline uh, that was used to support um, students and families as, as they needed support during this time and in implementing distance learning. Um, we had a lot of traffic on our social media and websites. And then finally, we created an end of the year survey to really help us um, gather the experiences of our students and our families and our teachers, and then also gauge their readiness for returning to school when that is possible. We had changes within our testing, as you know, uh, state testing was canceled. AP tests did take place for our, our AP students, but they were virtual or remote from homes. IB canceled their exams. And, uh, and so we, we did have changes in that area. Our, our counselors continued to support our students who were preparing for college and careers and supporting financial aid applications and all of those things during this time. And they did that virtually. And uh, we continued with our community engagement. Again, I mentioned uh, the PAC Plus met, as did the DLAC, as they helped make decisions. Every site had virtual parent meetings, coffees with the principals, and it was really exciting to see the increase in participation in the uh, coffees with the principals and Cafe Azteca at Azusa High School. Huge increase, which is exciting because it, it also gives us hope for how we might take learnings away from this time. And, and use them even when we're back in a face-to-face -face, um, uh, face -face setting. So we also had to write in the report a little bit about how we delivered high quality distance learning. And we developed our distance learning block schedule plan, which was very structured, had a, a daily schedule for our elementary and secondary students, uh, created collaboration time for teachers and staff, a parent and family connection time, interventions for students and individualized support. Um, it was all aligned to our, our state standards and used our district uh, approved curriculum and obviously in included a lot of technology integrate integration. And for grading, um, as the board recalls, uh, the district took a hold harmless grading policy during this time period. 
I did promise the PAC Plus that I would mention one thing during this presentation. And, and two, our two parents that represent uh, students with disabilities really uh, were pleased and, and so grateful for the special education teachers who worked so hard to create accommodations and modifications and to support students who, uh, who had disabilities with distance learning. And, and so I do wanna take a point to honor uh, their requests and, and acknowledge that work that uh, was done for all of our students during this time. We continue to focus on equity and this report asks us to really address how are we looking at our, our highest needs students, our English learners, our foster youth and our um, low income students. And, and we distributed over 5,000 Chromebooks as Arturo said uh, and helped families uh, connect to the internet and in very um, special circumstances where our families were, were in a, a circumstance when it was that it was almost impossible for them to connect, we were able to provide hotspots um, and, and get students online and, and involved in distance learning. And part of that, as you recall from our last meeting, was with the help of generous community organizations such as the Rotary Club, the One Million Project, uh, the Zusa Ministerial Society or Association who supported our efforts in finding ways to provide internet access to our highest needs families. And uh, during this time, we also distributed uh, school supplies to families halfway through the, the spring closure time, you know, families were running short and lines at stores were long. And so the district was able to distribute school supplies to every family that needed them. Uh, we continued to monitor our English learners and uh, specifically reaching out to every single newcomer, both at the district level and then also at the school level through teachers and administrators. And the same happened for our, um, our foster youth as we really looked at our highest needs students and made sure that um, we were supporting them during this time. Another big section that's addressed in the report is about our meal distribution. And uh, we served 30,957 meals per week on average uh, during the, the spring um, closures. And it was 90 plus employees, uh, nutrition services, MOT, administrators, contracted staff, working together to distribute meals for families. Um, it, it was a two day a week distribution, drive through distribution, which as we came near to the summer months, uh, went to a one day a week as we prepared for summer distribution. We, Azusa Unified was one of the few districts in this area that actually offered three meals, uh, both breakfast, lunch, and supper to, to our children ages zero to 18 in the Azusa community. And you know, true to the Azusa USD belief in continuous cycle of improvement, we really saw that happening with uh, meal distribution as Mark developed the QR code scan system where people could, didn't have to have their children in the cars, they didn't have to roll their windows down and the efficiency and effectiveness of meal distribution just improved week after week after week. And, and that was a great thing to see. And it's a wonderful thing that we can share as a, uh, of what we did during this time period. And of course, we also had a lot of our community businesses and organizations also contribute uh, and donate in this area, whether it was bags or gift cards to restaurants or fresh fruit, all of these were provided to our families because of the generosity um, of our Azusa business community and partners. So um, tonight you will be asked to approve the, the full report for this agenda item, but before you move to your vote, I am happy to answer any questions or hear any comments that you may have. I just have a quick comment of appreciation uh, for this. Uh, this was a requirement from the state. Um, there was no official quote unquote template. Um, there was a basically a Word document that said answer these, uh, but I do want to appreciate uh, Jennifer E.D. Bryant, the PAC Plus, as we looked at uh, developing this, that it was readable, presentable, um, and accessible. So, so thank you for, for that. Yolanda? Yes, I, I also uh, want to ditto on that. I'd like to thank you for the, this great report, but also of all the employees that were our essential workers, the classified employees, the teachers, the staff, the administration, we're all working together and making all these great things happen. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, Adrian. I, yeah, and I want to go ahead and echo, um, you know, bo both uh, um, 
both of you there and saying, first of all, um, thank you to all the just just the hard work L looking at looking at this and, and everything that goes into this. Yes, from our classified employees to, to uh, you know, with, with meal preparation to clerical staff doing things behind the scenes, just just, just ev everything again during this unprecedented time. Um, uh, but but to but to see the just this is the tremendous effort that went into things. It just I just want to communicate that it doesn't go unnoticed, and so um, we're just extremely grateful for 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 everybody, teachers, administrators, just just everybody. Thank you for everything. And and um, Jennifer, I just want to say to you to you specifically, um, just just thank you for 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 your hard work. I know that you know you get to present this, and 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 you're you're, you're you are then kind of like bringing together. Um, just some of the good things that have gone on, and that's that's a privilege in and of itself. Um, but but I, I also want to make sure that that just to, to acknowledge just the, the excellence with which you bring things to us as a as a board. Um, that I that I just continue to see. You know, I, I was looking through our um, the the survey, some of the survey results. You know, in our our board packet, and even looking at that and just seeing the excellence that you that that, that you put to the work that you do. Um, just just grateful for for it and grateful for you. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Shireen. Yeah, I, I, I also want to just echo Adrian. Um, we were thrown into an emergency situation, and I'm really proud of how everyone met the moment. I'm quoting our governor, and um, and really, really um, took on this huge challenge, and and really put together a really um, an amazing educational. I won't call it amazing, but a really, I, I would say we're looking across the state. I think a really strong educational. Um, access to, to some teaching and learning, um, and then and then of course I'm very very proud of, of our food distribution that, that you guys put together. So I just want to I just want to echo that. I do have a couple questions um, that I just want to put out there because I think they're really important um, and I don't see it in here. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to articulate is 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 how how many um, how many hours of live instruction our students were getting from our teachers? And so my first question is, so for elementary, how many, how many, and, not, and I understand that many people went above and beyond what was required, but so in our block schedule planning, how many hours of live instruction were our, our elementary students getting from their teachers? So at, That's a question. Uh, for me and, no, and, at, yeah. and anybody? <laughs> okay. At this point, I don't have that data uh, on me. I don't know. Um, there we, may we didn't build. We didn't. We didn't build it into the block schedule. I think. I mean, I think the block schedule had like certain amounts of time that teachers were on with students, right? Am I not? Am I right about that? So maybe, maybe Arturo, maybe you can answer my question. Yeah. So <clears throat> on a on a weekly basis uh, at the elementary level, uh, the instructional blocks were twice a week. Uh, for each grade level, depending on the grade level, of course, that was a different day and a different uh, time. Uh, and the times were two hours and 45 minutes each time. Um, and again, don't want to give the illusion that that was 100% all um, uh, synchronous learning, but those were the connection times for sure. On top of that, the, those were the instructional blocks. On top of that, uh, on a weekly basis, there was a student and family connection block uh, that also ran for two hours and 45 minutes um, where uh, home liaisons, uh, principals, teachers uh, were responding uh, to students, responding to parents uh, in terms of questions, clarifications, concerns, next steps, technology, whatever that may be. Uh, so that's, that's the way um, the elementary uh, went. And then what about middle and high school? Yep. For secondary, um, the blocks were uh, the same, two hours and 45 minutes. Unlike elementary, uh, there were two student and family connection, uh, two hour and 45 minute blocks a week, uh, figuring there's more students. Um, there are students who, who have questions themselves or clarifications or help, or I'm not sure I understood this. So that's why we built in uh, two instead of one, and that schedule was based on content, and so the students had math on Monday mornings, ELA on Monday afternoons, and that's kind of the, the, the schedule that, that they went. So they were, depending obviously on their schedule, but they were in their classes uh, for two hours and 45 minutes, instructional blocks throughout the week. 
So I guess, I, I mean, I guess I misunderstood. So I thought those were actually live instructions. So you're saying those are just instructional blocks, so they may, may, they may have been synchronous or, or asynchronous? That is it correct. Was, so, um, all right. Um, and then my, my other question um, is around, no, so that, I mean, that was my main question. So I, I think, I mean, and then I know you guys are doing planning internally. I mean, I think as we think about the next year, and I mean, I understand we're going to have to have plans for what happens if this happens again. Um, um, looking at the CCE playbook, right, that came out, looking at what Dr. Our State Board of our State Board President, Dr. Linda Lauren Hammond, talking about talking about how one to one to four hours of live daily instruction is is would be considered quality distance learning or at least minimum um that and then knowing that there's recent recent research co coming out that that shows that that higher income communities were able to make the transition and were able to keep attendance daily were able to continue with with ongoing instruction um and 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 daily daily instruction much more than what we're talking about i really hope that as we think about this equity approach that we have and as we plan for the next year that we think about how do we build in not only a plan that that puts that into place but then like you mentioned the toast is the training that everyone would need to actually do something like that so i just want to put that on the table because i think we should we should applaud ourselves for the hard work that happened but we should always aspire aspire to be even better um, and if we know something was not really ideal, then we need to work on that. So um, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, my allergies. I'd just like to thank everybody for all you did during that because it was, it, we just jumped off that cliff and all of a sudden everything had to be there to catch all the students. And I really appreciate the time and energy and effort it took everybody to get that going. So thank you. I, I, I think Gabriela has her hand up. Yes, Gabriela, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for, for putting this together. I want to go ahead and um, echo what my colleagues have said, but one of the things that I, um, we, we did, that the, it happened, it was an emergency, we took, we, we stepped into action, um, the block schedule was, was made, um, it was a really, uh, it, it, we were just made to to kind of just make decisions right as they came. We don't know what the future held. So I think we pretty much held it together until now we can breathe. Um, looking at this report, I would have to um, just agree. Uh, we can go ahead and look back uh, just to be able to fine tune um, where our weaknesses are and where we can improve with technology, instruction, and, um, and grading. And... Um, just moving forward in case we do have to go into another lockdown, we can look back to see where, um, you know, some of the great things that um, did come out of this and also to some of the things where we're perhaps still missing or um, we we need to, um, to we, we can take this time again, you know, to be able to um, bridge that gap, uh, to be able to have um, every student in our um uh, in our district, uh, be able to connect to a device for distance learning. Um, and uh, I, I like the equity that Shinaline was talking about. I, I don't think we had 100%. And so that's something to definitely, um, you know, for us to just continue having our conversation about. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Adrian? Yeah, I wanted to add uh, just one, one more quick thing, um, just also in agreement with my colleagues about, uh, you know, we went into this without, you know, by, by surprise. And, and I think any one of us would, would say that if we were to go back, there are some, there are some adjustments that we would make. There, there's some, some tweaks that, that you know, that, that, that we would make and, um, and, and, and we'll use this learning not only for whatever the fall looks like, but also for, you know, for, you know, Unfortunately, we, we now, you know, it, it, it's, it's on us now to, to, to kind of have a plan in place for in case there is a worldwide pandemic and how we would, you know, respond to that. But that's not something that, you know, we were necessarily prepared for before. And so with that being said, yeah, it, um, I'm, I'm pleased with, with everything that we were able to pull together up, uh, you know, so, so quickly. <clears throat> but but there, um, and, and now how do, how do we even raise that bar even further going into this, this next um, uh, school year with so many of the unknowns um, and potential, you know, ways that it plays out. Okay. Alrighty, so now we'll move on to 9.2, 
Uh, Actually, I'm sorry, you'll need to make, vote on that. Please. Make a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. Yes, thank you. All right, so do we have a motion? A motion, motion to. to uh, second. Okay. Motion by uh, board member Ariana, seconded by board member Rodriguez Pena. Any other comments? Okay, let's go ahead and vote on this. Oh my gosh, trying to. Yay. Is it popping up for people? It's not. It's not popping up for me. Yeah, no, you're the only one who hasn't voted. Okay, hold on. I think it's that I have to sync. It's not letting me sync. Ah, you know what? You're right. I was going to say, yeah. I'm in and out when that happens. Sorry, logging in again. It, yeah. It's bumped me out once already, too. Yeah, we're going to, it's going to, it's, it's stalled. So let's just take a voice vote. I vote yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I don't see. Adrian, wave your hand. You were on the other side. All right. <laughs> All right. So it's five zero passes. And we will move on to 9.2 update and approve the district's 2020 2021 budget. Mr. Bomarito. Yes. All right. This time I have your faces. So to start, but it's a, let's see. All right, so uh, tonight um, we're going to be asking you to approve the budget. Um, we have also prepared an updated set of information from the figures that have come out um, in the past few hours, actually. And so We'll be sharing what those are. Um, there was a SB 77 that we were able to get a lot of the figures from and to calculate what that means for Azusa. But to be clear, what you are voting on is the budget that we presented at our last board meeting. And the facts and figures in here um, are different than that. Um, and it is going to be the recommendation that you approve the budget so schools can um, receive their funding um, allocations, and then the district um, at a later date update the budget, uh, especially once all the trailer bills get, get um, updated. All right. So as a reminder, um, June 23rd is our scheduled date to approve the budget. And we'll have a series of additional meetings um, throughout the year to update that budget. So the next opportunity for us to create an update would be by the September 15th date, which would be the unaudited actuals. And then we'll have a first, second, and likely a third interim budget um, given the large number of deferrals that are in the assumptions, um, unless the feds come out with some additional funds. And then we'll start the process over uh, by approving a budget by June 23rd, 2021. So as a reminder, we had our public hearing on June 16th and tonight we were um, bringing this to you for approval. Um, and we went over that last time. So these were the facts and figures that we were able to bring together um, from the, the assembly bill and some other, other inside information. So COLA um, that we discussed last time was um, in a, a zero with an effective deficit factor of 7.92 or negative 7.92. And so the budget deal that has been reached between the legislators and the, the governor is to come out with a zero COLA. And so I've made the, that red because that is a number that has changed from the budget. And you can see these numbers have not changed, which was to budget zero as a COLA for the next three years. And STIRS and PERS did not change in the assumptions. 
And so there is additional dollars that you can see going from 1920 to 2021 and to 2122. So you can see the dip in the STRS um, percentage. And then no additional dollars coming into 2223. And that's where you see it go back up. PERS, the same thing. Um, it is significantly lower than it was at second interim, um, but you have to remember at this point, um, you were looking at close to 25% in 2122. Um, special ed, um, actually this should be red. It, it was a little bit higher. So that isn't one number that went down. Um, but it's still up from what we're receiving right now, uh, dollars per kid. So we, we re right now receive 557, instead of it being 645, it's now 625 uh, per ADA. And this is a huge shift that um, was just announced today. The CARES Act funding has been a little bit all over the place from the governor's proposal, um, being based off of one formula, the legislators a different formula, and they compromised on a completely different um, set, of, set of figures. But it is beyond what either one of them had um, put together when we calculated out the governors or the legislators. It's actually more than both of them. So it's $11.3 million in CARES funding which is something that's gonna be essential as we look at the deficits later. Uh, restricted programs. So if you remember, we had some 50% reductions in some of the restricted programs, others were negative uh, 10%. So to have no change is huge for those programs for preschool, for um, ACEs, for all of our restricted programs to have that zero is, is a, a really, really exciting thing. Um, deferrals. So this is the trigger that we had spoke about at our last meeting. This did not change one month of deferrals for 1920. We will not receive our June apportionment until July. But under this plan, we would not receive nearly 50% of our funding, and we'll give those exact dollars later on. Um, if there is not an economic recovery, we can see more of that. Um, and so we could be getting close to, you know, a year of dollars not received. So these additional dollars, we need to make sure that we have enough cash to, to pay um, the bills moving forward. And I'm going to turn it over to Magna to go over the specifics for Azusa. Let's see here. Oh yeah, you're muted. There you oh. go. There you go. Um, thank you, Mark, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be presenting part of the budget update, uh, more specific details of the revenues. The LCFF revenue is our prime source of revenue. And, um, and as we have uh, presented last week, these are the second interim um, projections. And uh, last, week, last week, number 2021 adopted. One more. One more one, okay. Uh, so uh, as you can see in the red one, that's what we uh, projected based on the May revised governor's budget. And it has a drastic decline of 10% and deficit factor of 7.92%. But the, with the budget deal that they reach, uh, we got little information that now there is no reduction in the funding, but we are not gonna receive any COLA. So that looks like for our district, we are going to get more money, less than what we projected at second interim, but it's going to be more than what we projected as uh, ad adopted budget. So it looks like we are going to receive 80 85 million in 2021 year and uh, 80.3 and so on for the out, out three years. Um, so the difference between second interim and uh, um, budget deal is really, really lower than what was we were estimated before. And looking at the detailed numbers in the next slide. 
So as we you know, looked at these numbers last week as well, but there was a huge difference where we looked at last uh, week, uh, the uh, relation between the uh, funding is based on enrollment ADA and it's based on the funding per ADA, how much we received per ADA each year. The last year we looked at the 1920 among 11,553 for 2021, it was drastically declining almost like $900, like 10,500. But now it went back up about 11,576 and on an average about 11,500 out two years as well as it's a 0% COLA and just a uh, slight increase based on the class size reduction augmentation. Uh, and as you can see in budget deal 2021, the numbers or revenue is going to be increasing way higher than what we have budgeted in our uh, uh, adopted budget. It's going to be almost 6.7 million higher than what we have budgeted in 2021 and uh, almost 6 million more in each year thereafter. So that's a good news for our district that we are going to be you know, uh, receiving more money as far as uh, the uh, deal that they reach. And uh, we are going to see more in detail in the next slide. LCFF supplemental and concentration. Make, make real, real quick, going, yes. back to, going back to the last one, just to be clear, I'm, I'm looking yeah. at, the, at, at the presentation that's online and the numbers are different. So, is, but the, the ones on that you have that you're displaying, that is the updated and current one, but the ones, number, slide 17 on, online is, is incorrect. Right. So okay. that la the online that has the last uh, last week's numbers, and so we just updated to give you more, you know, better numbers, because that will give you idea how much we are increasing from year to year okay. and not showing the decline. So that's why we updated this number recently. Going over to next slide, um, LCFF supplemental and concentration, which is also part of the big LCFF revenue. And uh, as we know that this is for unduplicated count of our uh, kids and uh, that's very important money to have. And uh, as we can see that that is also showing increase based on the deal that uh, they have agreed upon. And um, so last week we saw that about 2 million reduction in each year. We are seeing now that we are capturing almost uh, 1.6 million each year back. So. It's a reduction from a, a prior projection of second interim, but it's much better uh, than what, uh, what was the May revise came about. Looking at the next uh, slide. This is a, a similar slide that we uh, shared last week, and that's uh, um, Azusa's per ADA revenue versus expenditure. How much we are spending uh, versus how much we are receiving money. And so the for 18, 19, as we have seen the best year in the SSI Unified, and we received about 753 and spent 648, which is well under the uh, revenue, which was a really good year. But as we see the decline in 1920 to 448, uh, but we are still well within our uh, you know, means and it's, we are spending, we are expected to spend less than what we receive. Um, Going forward to 2021, if you remember last week, I showed you the chart like upside down because we were not receiving $900 for that year. And uh, it looked much better for the district because we are not gaining a lot, but we are not in negative. So we are at least uh, floating. And um, so obviously the expenditures stay the same um, for STRS, PERS, step and column and the special education contribution. So that increase um, from year after year, and it's about 500 each year. And the slight increase in revenue, and that's just a class size reduction augmentation grant. There is no COLA that we are going to get, uh, as far as we know right now, there is no COLA included in 2021 to 22, 23 year. Um, as far as even the deal doesn't have any COLA included in it. I wanted to add one thing, which is in 1920, um, there was a cost savings due to COVID-19 that, especially in the special ed realm, um, made this number much smaller than the year prior or the year prior or what we're projecting out in the future. Um, so to, to kind of add perspective. I have a question about that. How does that, how does that affect maintenance of effort? for special ed funding then? 
So, so we, oh, go ahead, Megna. So we we do have to spend obviously more than what we have to, we have spent last year, but looking at some of the expenditures and some of the uh, cost in personnel and that kind of reduced because we didn't have any subs filling in for or you know those type of expenses were reduced. So that's why we are looking at to save some money in that area. But I think my, my question remember, is really around like, so does, does this rebench our maintenance of effort? What ha I mean, what happens? Are we, are we going to have to spend that money somehow? I mean, what, what happens? So remember, this chart is showing the increase right. in expenditure. Oh, so that's so, we so, spend, so, we, so we're spending more. Okay. We're still Correct. spending $101 more than we did the year prior, Correct. but it didn't go up $300 more per year uh, like, like what we had said before, right? So it, it still went up, just not as drastically. All right. All right. Oh, and um, and then stars and pearls, as we know, nothing, no rates been changed. Whatever uh, was uh, approved and may revise, that stays same, and which is a good news for us because it's lower, and uh, governor has um, contributed more to calpers and calsters, and so. We are seeing decline in 2021 year to from 11.1 .1 million to 10.2, and pension cost is uh, another significant uh, um, cost for our district. So that looks uh, really good, and we are hoping that in future also governor contribute more to calpers and calsters, so then we can have lesser cost. Um, and uh, from here, Mark is going to take over. So. We described, or I described in the very beginning that a, a large amount of CARES dollars are coming in. And so before, under the governor's plan, um, there, was, there was three pots, but now there is four different pots of money that will make up the CARES as far as formulas go. So we will, and this is the money that is the most certain because it's already been estimated by the state. Um, there is about $5 million that will come for unduplicated students under a, a specific formula, 2.4 for special ed students, and 1.4 million that is based on a district's LCFF enrollment numbers or ADA numbers. Um, and so when you combine that together, you, we are now looking at $11.3 million of CARES Act dollars. Um, it will be interesting, I will say, to, to see how we can use these dollars um, because the details really have not come out. If you look at all of the language, it is about uh, COVID-19 response and providing instruction. Um, and so the dollars need to be spent by December and that is coming from the feds. That's not a state decision. Um, <laughs> And so you'll have 11.3 million to spend very quickly. And in our assumptions, we treated them as unrestricted dollars to show the most flexibility, but we will definitely have to wait and see if there are specific restrictions that make that more challenging. Yeah, Next. This is a one-time fund, correct? So we wanna go ahead and clarify that, right? Yes, it's one-time funds that need to be spent by December. Yes. Um, next is deferral. So one of the big differences in the governor's plan and the legislator's plan was the amount of deferrals. Uh, the the uh, legislators had more, but this, this definitely um, you know, is up there pretty close to what they had in their proposal. And this is where cash and cash analysis is going to be essential to make sure that we're um, able to continue paying payroll and our vendors. And so in 1920, we'll have $10 million deferred. So that means that we'll not receive in June about $10 million and we'll get it in July. So that one's not that big of a deal. We can, we can manage that. Um, but in 2021, we'll have five months worth of deferral. So essentially we'll get paid for half of the year. And um, you know, 
that means we'll have to have that much cash in all of our funds that we can borrow from um, in order to make payments in 2122 when when the cash will really be getting short. And so we did pass an interfund borrowing resolution um, and we'll definitely need to look and see how um, how much money and when we will need that. And the district will need to explore a trans um, in, in the end of 2021, possibly 2122, uh, which is when you borrow from the county or, or an outside provider. Um, and the county is getting set up to issue those. They're creating multiple pools for districts of different um, different needs and timing will be able to join those trans pools. Um, but again, that is interest for all the dollars that we borrow and that we'll have to pay to the county to have access to those funds. So as, as these funds are being uh, allocated for, for districts to borrow, have there been any talk about uh, the interest rate on what we will borrow this money on? Will it be this, you know, right now interest rate or, or at so, that time uh, interest rate, so? Yeah, so the county will set those interest rates. Um, they will be in the range of two to three and a half percent. depending on a, a number of factors. Which are, do you know the factors? Credit rating, um, I guess the, the, the market demand, um, all, all, um, I guess how much money you're needing to borrow. And also what the base, I used to work in credit card services. And so you have the base federal interest rate and then X amount above prime, so. Correct, and it, it depends if we're going out in the market or we're borrowing from the county. So obviously the best place would be to borrow directly from the county. They will provide us the best service and the best rate. Okay. Um, okay. So that is um, some it is a huge reason why we'll need to maintain a healthy reserve. And it will almost become more important to the district than how much money we have available in the budget, just because the numbers will be um, so large. Um, so next, um, if we we just kind of get past the deferrals and looked at what does that do to the reserve for the budget, right? So that won't be for dollars in the budget, but for actual just what the budget is. At second interim, we said that the district would have to reduce by 4.9 and then 4.4 million and then uh, do nothing in the last year. Then at adopted budget, we said under the governor's plan, you would have to reduce by 13 and a half million followed by four and then three to hit the 3% reserve. And then lastly, um, under this budget deal with the projections that we have as our assumptions, we have a much rosier picture. Um, and again, this doesn't take into to account the cash issue, but we would have to reduce by 13, I'm sorry, by 3 million, um, basically the first two years and then 2 million the last year. Um, to kind of map that out, here is the second interim versus the adopted budget. So you can see where we um, had those CARES dollars come in in 1920 and the cost savings coming in and then the big decline because of the deficit factor. And then now you see this kind of crazy line go straight up for 2021, where we have 11 plus million in CARES Act dollars being accounted for, and then a very steep decline down. 
Um, and so because of those CARES Act dollars being counted as unrestricted at this point, um, that's what's allowing the district to, to have those smaller reductions than even what we had at second interim. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will open it up for questions. No questions? Comments? I have, I have a few comments slash questions. Um, so, so to be, so this is this is fresh, you know, hot off the press here, right, uh, Mark? And, and so you you guys put this together in, in a number of hours, um, but you you also indicated that this is that even though this is fresh and this this is fresh and new information that what is still being pushed uh, uh for us to or being recommended forward is what was on last week's um what? agenda um so i guess where i'm uh, so i'll just communicate like so I, I understand and can you communicate like the the process and the procedure and and some of the some of the timelines and deadlines that we're up against um with the fiscal year and whatnot because I, I'll just say that it, it, it um, I, so we're getting this presentation, but it, but it isn't the actual budget that's being uh, processed. So, so we, there will have to be an update very soon um, where, where we will make an official change. So, so this is in essence procedural, uh, procedural step that we need to take. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Sure. So the, the district needs to adopt the budget by June 30th. That is the last date for us to have a balanced budget. Um, unfortunately, the state has the same timeline, which is that the governor needs to sign the budget by the 30th. And the, because of everything going on, those timelines have been stretched. Um, the legislators approved their budget on their back very last day, which was the 15th. And fortunately, budget negotiations went relatively quickly, and we were able to get the budget details today um, from basically the lobbyists um, that we're able to get a hold of. So um, it is essential that we do pass a budget by the 30th. And it is, it is um, essential that our schools be able to have the budget roll into the, our system so they can start moving forward with their purchases. And I, and my, or I should say that the department will make sure that our, our budget gets updated um, and that we have the updated numbers, hopefully by um, unaudited actuals. And that will reflect these numbers and any of the other trailer language that may accompany um, these details. So, so would there, is there an option or what would the process be if we were to look at like July, now that we have new information, if we were to look at, at having a July be the target when we would, you know, kind of correct and update our budget? Is, is that even an option? It is an option. You can do it sooner. Um, a, a natural budget place is an audit actually, but you could always, you could always do a separate meeting and update it sooner. Um, I, I think it would be essential in the meantime to have a discussion around um, cash and what, what we can produce from business services is a map of where cash will, will be tight and what we should do to address those, those months, whether it is to go out for a trans or to implement additional reductions. Okay. Yeah. Can, can we maybe, um, I, so I don't know, I don't know who we, so I know Mark, you're, you won't, you won't be sitting in the seat. So I don't, you know, I, I don't know, Arturo, if you're able to, to speak to that and some of the process, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to, I'm, I'm tempted to, to not vote yes on, on this because I, because I know that it's not the actual budget, but I understand that the, the procedural process of it and how we need to move forward. Um, I, I would like, and I'd love to hear what colleagues have to, have to say, and Arturo, if you can speak into it as well, um, if we can sooner rather than later make the updates, um, if we are going to take the step today um, and not wait until um, that, that later date to make, uh, uh, you know, some of those changes. Can I, can I say something? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll wait, I'll, I'll wait to our answers. I'm sorry, Adrian asked the question. 
Salt Lake. Yeah, well, definitely, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so yes, we're, we are in, in transition period, uh, as Mark spoke about uh, at the beginning. Um, again, a huge uh, applause for, for, for taking um, what was out there uh, to build, right. construct this. <clears throat> Uh, but as he talked about, as the details come out with the trailer bills and the dust starts to settle, uh, that's when we'll be able to get and move into more clarity around that. And so, so yes, uh, we can definitely bring it uh, as soon as we get more clarity in terms of the actual, um, the numbers and the actual uh, where, where, where it is that these uh, budgets landed. Shironin? Um, just a couple of things. Well, first, I want to ask a question. So, Mark or Magna, in terms of adjustments, are you? I mean, are you? What you are you saying that we're going to go through a budget adoption process later on in this school year? Or are you talking about just every at every meeting we we make budget adjustments on our on our consent calendar? Is that is that what you're talking about? Like what? I, I, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to understand what you're talking about. And normally, because normally that happens through budget adjustments. Right. You want to answer? Maybe? Yeah, so Mark or Mark or Magna either. Okay. okay. So <laughs> during the yes, so once we adopt it tonight, then any adjustment that we are going to make or revise the budget for with this new changes that budget uh, trailer bill comes with, then we do have to go through the consent calendar budget re revisions or adjustments. So it won't be like a, we're waiting until the the um, unaudited actuals to to update this budget. No. Right, no. So what, what he means is that we can do, usually is that we do it right now, adopt the budget, and then come when we are closing the books, financials ready for unaudited actuals, we can revise the budget then and present it that time. Usually that's the flow, but we can always do it earlier. So, okay, that, that's, that's helpful. I don't know if that helps you, Adrian. So that it's does. not. Yeah. yeah. So then the, my other question, well, my, other, my comment, this is more just a historical perspective. Um, so, uh, before we, in our wisdom of a state, as a state population, decided to um, penalize our legislators um, if they didn't adopt the budget by June 15, um, and there was pretty much every year the the budget was not by the state was not adopted until well after June 30th. So we, as school districts, would have to adopt our budget just based on whatever assumptions we have from the May revision or whatever guidance we got from the LA County to adopt. And then we would have to make those revisions that Megna just talked about. So it's not like we haven't we haven't operated in this kind of a approach before, just because of unknowns. Um, the other thing that I would add is it's not very clear whether what's going to happen with the state legislature because they left they they left open a re, uh, that for them to come back and re look at the budget after the tax returns come in, ta tax receipts come in July fifteenth. So I think most of us are anticipating that in August, our state legislature is going to be reviewing the budget and updating it, which would impact us. Um, and then the last piece that I was going to mention is, so I don't, I don't want us as a board to think that this is a fake budget and not the real budget. This is a real budget. This really is the budget that we are adopting. And this is a budget that we're going to live by. I think because Magna, I mean, because our staff know that things are changing they're going to be conservative and luckily we don't do a lot of spending during the summer but i wouldn't as a board member feel like this is a fake budget this is really a, the budget and we are really adopting it because this is these, these are the rules that we had to use to to adopt this budget well well and i guess so i i um everything you said on the first part make, makes makes sense i i think um uh like on on the second end, end of that like to I, I get that this is not a fake fake budget but if if we were if we were making decisions based on what we you know know knew to be true a week ago, um, that calls for thirteen point five million dollars in reductions next year. I don't I don't see how we would not make some of make make additional cuts this this current year. So so I guess I hear saying it's not a fake budget, but at the same time I'm I'm having to make the the the, the conscious choice to ignore that reality. Um, as, as known, Other, otherwise I, I, I could, I would not be able to in good conscience move forward with a $13.5 million cut all in one year next year without making additional cuts this year. So I get that it's not fake, but, but it's also not fully accurate so, and authentic. So what I would say to that though, Adrian, though, is, is that, I, and I think, is that 
we could we 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 could not make those budget cuts that you just that you just uh, alluded to and be okay this next year. It just means that we have to make humongous cuts the year after. So it mm -hmm. still is a fiscally responsible in the short term budget. I, I mean, I don't want to yeah, go back and forth on this, but yeah. but 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 the thing, but but I as a board member is not, I'm not comfortable like in the in the dark of night um, trying to identify this this amount of budget cuts without any input. We went through a very we went through a lot of input from our community stakeholders before we decided the cuts that we made this last year. So I just would not be comfortable to be all of a sudden, okay, we're gonna add 10 more million onto our cuts, right? That's not something that I'm comfortable with. I think I, what I would say, and I appreciate this, is that I'm, we, we're very lucky that we have a, I would not say a large reserve, some people around us have larger reserves, but a significant reserve that is cushioning us. Um, I know there's a district right next to us, contiguous of us, who right now is at their 3% reserve. So they don't have the luxury we have of trying to figure out when we make these cuts. They have to make them right now because otherwise they're not, I mean, they're not even going to make their, their state requirements for 3% reserve. So, uh, so I mean, I, I think we're just going to have to disagree, agree to disagree sure. on like, you know, what this is, what, what we do right now. Okay. Anybody else? I saw Yolanda, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, uh, Shironine answered my question, and I appreciate right. that, Shironine, because I felt the same way um, uh, to adopt it or, or to vote on it when it's not, <clears throat> you're bringing something different than what we're reading in our binder that I had originally, and then it's changed. So, and I'm not calling it fake. I'm just calling it that it, it, the figures are totally different. So uh, I'm not comfortable voting on it, but with Shironine's explanation, I appreciate that. I, I get it. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Any other comments? I would have to say yes. I can understand, um, in a sense, why this would be a little, you know, um, not that it's a fake budget, but as things are changing in Sacramento, and they're changing, uh, uh, you know, each week. Um, as we speak, I think it's important that we do adopt this budget and that we add revisions to it um, because of the fact that COVID-19 did throw a little wrench in our parade here and our, the way that we normally operate. Um, we have to be able to adapt and be able to come back and, um, you know, with the help of Magna and our future interim um, CBO who's going to be coming in, be able to... Um, you know, make those adjustments as they come from Sacramento, from the Department of Education, so, and the governor. Thank you. Okay, any more comments or questions? All right, with that said, uh, do I have a motion on the floor? I make a motion to approve. Oh, I'll second. I think I'll have a motion. Okay, okay. Gabrielle. Uh, Board member Ariana's uh, motions seconded by board member Cruz Gonzalez. Uh, we've discussed, so uh, let's vote. <clears throat> and it passes 5 0. And now we will move. <clears throat> On to uh, 9.3, approve resolution 1920-56, exempting the old schoolhouse project from city of Azusa zoning. So let's... Do I have a motion? Uh, I mean, so I, I would like to motion that we, you know, table table in essence, but I'd like to discuss it. Still. A discussion. Okay. You're, you're muted. Uh, can we just discuss it? We don't, we, I mean, we don't have, I mean, we can discuss it without taking okay. action first. All right. Sounds good. I would Bye. like, uh, uh, Mr. Ortega, Mr. Ortega, if you can please explain this resolution, please. Sure. Uh, just as a FYI, uh, we have uh, invited Terry Tao uh, here as well to, uh, to take questions. Uh, but in essence, um, this resolution um, is to exempt uh, the old schoolhouse project uh, from, a, from city uh, Azusa zoning. Uh, this resolution uh, is not a determination or a decision by the board in terms of what is happening uh, to the schoolhouse. Uh, this is just uh, a motion 
to be able to exempt us from the from the zoning uh, and to continue the process in 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 uh, in respects to a later decision uh, and being able to make those decisions in the in the future. So what is what is the purpose of our re removing the zoning? What 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 what's behind that? I'll, I'll try to answer that question if it would be helpful. Um, yes, please. When, uh, when we were looking at this issue, um, there was uh, traditionally with schools, uh, they have what's called a case called Hall versus City of Taft, which addresses the constitutional relationship between school districts and cities. So traditionally a city and school district uh, occupy the same rung, so to speak. Um, and the legislature decided that it made no sense for a, a city to uh, have jurisdiction over anything that has to do with school or school related activities. And um, there have been a number of cases interpreting what that means, uh, including things like uh, lights on school fields being considered school activities. Um, when I looked at this with the CEQA consultants, um, the conclusion was that this is really a school activity because you uh, have Slauson School and you have needs with regard to Slauson School. And this is um, not, there are uh, different things that could be done with regard to uh, this uh, historic structure or the structure. And, um, uh, that what your overriding concern, what it is that the school board's overriding issue is, is what it is that your school activities are not um, necessarily being placed in a position where, for example, if you're a developer, uh, having to uh, consider other elements uh, that may be uh, coming in. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to have an environmental impact report presented to you with all of the various impacts, including costs. And we felt that it would be better to not have the city um, impose zoning restrictions on you and say, this is our position. Uh, instead, have you do a full and fair evaluation of the environmental report. Uh, in that environmental report, we're gonna consider historic- Sorry, excuse me, who, who, de who decided that? You're saying, it was decided. So my question is, who decided that? Traditionally, what happens is the cities will follow Hall versus City of Taft, which is a Supreme Court case. In this particular case, the city had some comments. Um, we are considering those comments and the comment letter uh, response comes out as part of the EIR. And that is going to come out after um, uh, this resolution is adopted. Uh, so, because this resolution actually has an effect with regard to how the response letter is prepared. Um, the significance for us is um, it, it's important for the school district to keep all of the school district functions intact rather than have the school district functions be overseen by the city, which is uh, what it is that this zoning restriction happens to do uh, which is why we've asked for a government code section 53094 resolution to make it clear if that makes sense so can i ask um so is this building marked as a historical site in, it, in writing it, it, yes it is not it is not designated historical uh by uh state or federal uh it has only um uh, received some review with regard to uh, city. Uh, so uh, it's not it's not considered historic under um, historic building code. Uh, it's not considered historic under um, historic in the normal sense. So I'll say my um, the so some of the concern that I have is that um, I, I I understand it, and it's been it's been described thoroughly. You know, so, so some of our what what our what our 
kind of kind of rights and, and, and some of the jurisdiction and wh where that lies and, and what a what a school district can do versus what a where, where the, the school district makes decisions versus the city that that's been thoroughly um, described and explained to me and I and I get that um, I I would I would suggest that that does not e even though a school district may have the 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 absolute right or you know ability to make certain decisions in a certain way um, that does not preclude us from from like taking into consideration our partners at the city and take a take into consideration um just just the the, the relationships and, and the partnership with with the the, the city and so um I, I, Arturo I saw that you confirmed that you did reach out last week and and um speak to uh, Sergio the city manager about it um Jerry did did you also reach out um to uh, historical society thank you um thank you for that Jerry so I think that those those are important steps and I'm glad that that happened I, I guess I'll say that I'm I'm a bit surprised that um that it didn't happen sooner. Um, I think that we had some, that there was some time and space to be able to have, um, I mean, a, a good number of months where, where there, there was time to make these, you know, ha have these conversations formally and informally. Um, and so I, I did have, uh, you know, a couple conversations, you know, over the course of this past, you know, these past few days, where there are people who are communicating some some of their concerns, and so again, it's just unfortunate that this didn't happen sooner. We can't go back and change it. I wish we could. We can't go back and change that. We are we are where we are now, um, and and with that in mind, there's a couple things I would like to you know to suggest and recommend. One, yes, that we do as it was already suggested earlier, um, table this um, and postpone it. To just even to if, if we look at the next meeting, j just as a to, to bring it back up for conversation. I think it would be great if if um, we were able to kind of call together in a, an ad hoc um, meeting somehow, even, even if it needs to be Zoom or whatnot, just to have some of those conversations. And so I know that some things have changed on the city side on, on their council. And so there may need to be an update to, to who, who sits on their ad hoc committee. Um, uh, but, but I think that there might be value in, in, in having some conversations. And I want to be clear, that does not change what we as a, a, a what Azusa Unified School District is able to do in the jurisdiction that it has, but, but taking time to just uh, con consider the, the partnerships and, 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 and those relationships to me is, is vital. And there's no reason why we didn't. And there's no reason why we, we, why, you know, we still can't now. Is that a motion, Adrian? I second it. That's a motion. Okay. Uh, Gabriella, did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to go ahead. Well, I was going to agree with Adrian to go ahead and table this. And I think it's really important that the ad hoc, uh, the individuals that are in the ad hoc committee for the city, that they meet um, as soon as possible in July. Uh, the clock is ticking. Um, I mean, this is a conversation that needs to happen. I would also like to ask that um, uh, the five board members and the five city council come together for a meeting for, you know, for all 10 of us to meet. I think it's been a really long time for, you know, since a meeting like that has happened. And I'm Arturo, uh, Madam President, I would like to go ahead and put that on the table as well. Okay. So can, can, can we maybe move forward that with, forward with that then? So, so um, yep. yes, motion to table, but then also direction. Arturo, if you could, if you could help activate that, I'll say that I would be available. I'm, I'm taking some time off. I would be available the week of the sixth. Um, if, if we wanted to see about scheduling um, an, an ad hoc meeting, um, Yolanda, I'm not sure what your schedule looks like and, and, and your availability. And of course, we'd have to consider what the council has to say as well. But, but I would be in favor of, of having a conversation soon. Uh, you're muted, um, Yolanda. Per perhaps if, if I could have the floor for just a minute, and I, well, I'm not going to urge you to change your, your vote. Um, I w I do have a Could, couple. Actually, things. actually, y Yolanda, would you? I know you were, you were saying something. Could, would you? Uh, yeah. Uh, all I want to say is that uh, I believe they go dark in July because okay. I know uh, Gabby mentioned July. Ju I believe the city goes dark in July. So just, May, just throwing would, that would out. Would you there. would would you be open, uh, Yolanda? Are you open to having a, looking to have a conversation that that week in July if if the city is to have an ad hoc? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. I mean yeah. Okay. I mean if they, if they want to meet, yes, if, I I will. Yes. Okay. Um, go Terry. Yeah, there are just a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. Um, so, so that we're clear, um, there is nothing wrong with the process that we have engaged in. Um, I am a little um, a surprised that the city is taking this resolution as uh, the place where they want um, the process to stop. Uh, we are still going to go through with a sequel analysis a uh, CEQA hearing uh, and also a full comment response letter uh, with regard to uh, the comments that were received from the city. 
Um, I uh, would, uh, I do have uh, some concerns with regard to uh, holding the process up, but I would uh, suggest that perhaps at some point we have a closed session uh, to more thoroughly discuss some of the issues associated with um, the resolution. Hey, Gabriella, you had something to say? Yes, I, I, I can understand what you're saying, um, Terry, but I also have concerns because under my impression, um, I, 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 the conversation we had over a year ago, Terry, um, and the, the procedures that we had asked for it to happen did not happen. And we just learned about it this last meeting. Um, and I, I'm uncomfortable with that. So um, I, I understand that you're saying that the sequel analysis and the hearing needs to happen. But at the same time, you're right, we do need to have a closed session about this. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very disheartened that what I thought was taking place did not actually take place. Um, you know, with that being said, um, I think that's all I have right now. Okay, Adrian. Um, Sheila, yeah, my hand up. First, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Sheila. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a question for you, Terry. Then, are you saying that we have a certain timeline that we have to keep to with this? What What are you saying? I I'm not saying that this could happen here, but I do have a concern. So I'm gonna I'm gonna point you to some articles um, that would be reflective of the concern that I have. Um, if you look right, back, so, so so the my my but my question, Terry, was really just around timeline, right? Like us not taking action on this is not gonna has, is not gonna have an impact on on the work that's already been done. That's what I'm saying. It's not gonna have an impact on the sequel work. Um, I'm, right, okay, what I'm concerned about is this. Um, I've run into the situation before where uh, a somebody, be it city or individual, tries to hold up the process while they quickly run to a um, historic board to try to get a landmark designation on a piece of property. And then it changes the analysis. Um, the uh, perfect example of that is uh, Orange Unified had sold the piece of property. And um, during the uh, period of due diligence before the developer could um, uh, develop the property, they were able to designate a building on uh, property historic, which completely changed the analysis and essentially caused the property to fall out of escrow. Um, I, I would hate to see the situation where the school district is placed in a position of um, essentially having to care and pay for and then upgrade uh, this building uh, when you're um, when your primary goal is to handle uh, students, uh, I realize that this is a um, historic resource. I realize that there is a long history to the building. Uh, I think that it is um, well within the district's um, it con consideration what it is that you're gonna do with it, but I don't want the district to be placed in a position where you're compelled to do it. So my concern is if you wait too long, you might get compelled into doing it. And um, there is no timeline right now. I'm just worried that okay. uh, when somebody's saying hold the press, the, hold the presses, that um, there could be other processes working that we may not be aware of that could make things more difficult for you or make it impossible for you. So I think I think you're right that this conversation is best done in, 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 in closed session. I think I had just asked about the timeline. So I appreciate the answer about the timeline. So thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, and um, only only thing I'll add is um, I, I hear you again, Tara, I hear you talking about like that the district is in in the in the right in that the correct procedure has been followed. I mean, technically, I, I, I understand that and I get that. And I'm not questioning or challenging that at all. Um, I'm just I'm just simply saying that sometimes it's possible to go um, to go above and beyond what is merely um, required and 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 take take additional steps and and I and so I I'm, I'm a little disappointed that and, and and I'm not saying that this is on you but I'm just I'm saying that I'm a little disappointed that some of those extra above and beyond steps um, had not been been taken because um, I know that we were under the impression that that it did um, with that being said even to be uh, more specific about the motion that I'm, I'm making I would like to motion that we table this for 
a, for a July 7th for the, the, the for the July 7th uh, board meeting so that it, it comes on to the very next one um, and we don't we don't push things back but but hopefully that will allow for some some time to get some conversations on the uh, on the calendar I don't want I don't want to push this off I just wonderful I, I just and appreciate it move along and I'm okay yeah. with and I'm okay with you with your change with your amended motion Matt. thank you okay any more comments I just want to uh, just re-clarify that um, uh, we're tabling this to July 7th and uh, that I just want to make sure that I'm being heard that I am asking Madam President for us to uh, to to give some direction and for us as a school board to meet with City Council soon. Mm -hmm. um, so if that could be. Um, so I see your hand up Yolanda. Uh, just to be clear I think. It's two different things. <laughs> yeah. So we can we can yeah, talk about that in our ad hoc and the ad hoc conversation. Exactly. We can bring that up and talk about that. Exactly, Yolanda. What I like to say is, um, you know, I, I what what uh, Gabby Arianis is asking. We don't have a consensus. I mean, it's one person wanting something, but we have not all agreed that yes, let's do this. We can't just say what we. I mean, what we want to do. It, it, that's why there's five of us. We have to all agree. Yes, we'll do this. That's, okay. a, that's my opinion. What I'd like to do is, okay, next week we can put it onto the agenda to have a discussion about moving in with, you know, working with the city council and having a joint meeting. I think that's how, because this is dealing with something else and that's different. Could could I ask, could I ask instead that um, since, since Yolanda and I are on the ad hoc committee that, uh, that we hear that, we hear those that you know those wishes and can we can we take this into a conversation with the ad hoc uh, yes. committee from city council and let that be the place where, where where it begins and we come out from there as opposed to us taking action and steps without considering our, our counterparts with the city certainly i'm okay with that i just want to clarify uh, board member yolanda pena i think it's important i'm bringing it up because it's something that um we haven't talked about since i've been on the board um uh, that we should have a meeting in the next several months. Um, so I, I'm just bringing it up for us to have a discussion about it, um, to put it, you know, to write it down somewhere so we can, you know, talk about yeah. it in the future. But I agree with you, Adrian. Um, I think it's important that you guys do talk to the city council about it and then bring it back and we have a discussion about it, of course. I, I totally understand that. All I'm saying is when, when we give a, a request, or I, I think the five of us should agree that we should follow through with this request. That's all I was I'm just saying. Ask, I was just asking to no. put it on the agenda. That's it. I'd like to summarize really quick, uh, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, on July 7th, uh, we're gonna have two agenda items, one for closed session and one for open session. It will be the same identical um, board agenda item that is uh, present in closed session uh, right now. Um, board member uh, Yolanda and board member Adrian uh, will take the initiative to reach out uh, to their counterparts in the city uh, to think about, clarify, have a conversation in terms of uh, process and, and this this particular topic. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Co correct. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> with with the addition of a of, of the, the topic of uh, not only this, the schoolhouse topic but also the topic of uh, a joint meeting. Joint meeting. We will have that in the ad hoc uh, conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments? Okay, I guess we can go ahead and vote on um, tabling it to the next meeting. Tabling it till the next meeting. Sorry, just, just to be clear, it's saying approve the resolution, but that's not, I'm, we're still voting yes on the table. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is five zero, and then now we will move on to uh, nine point four Azusa Unified School District's legal services. And Arturo, thank you. <clears throat> um, so, at our last, um, at a previous meeting, uh, we we discussed and we talked about. Um, 
having and trying to come up with next steps in terms of legal services for Azusa Unified School District. Uh, in an email conversation uh, with uh, Ms. Jerry Bibles Vogel, um, we felt that it was prudent and necessary uh, to gain clarity in terms of um, what is uh, the board's desire uh, in terms of legal services. Uh, so I wanna point out just three kind of things um, that, that we, we want to try and, and get a clear understanding so that when we are moving to next steps, uh, that we are actually doing the next steps that uh, we all believe are supposed to be the next steps. So uh, we think that there are there's three um, major um, points of clarification. Number one, uh, currently, we have a process um, that has been triggered and has been set in motion um, that is an RFP process. Um, during conversations uh, and during kind of logistics, there were multiple suggestions, one of them being uh, that there be two board members uh, present uh, for the opening of those proposals and maybe three board members in Zoom. Uh, different conversations, uh, should that have been on today's board meeting? Is that a separate board meeting? We know that that's gonna take time. Um, and so we had kind of that, that set in motion, but at the same exact time, there were also conversations about, wait a minute, time out. Was this supposed to be an RFP or was this supposed to be an RFQ process? And so for, for, for us to continue on the RFP process, when, when we were supposed to be on an RFQ process, obviously. Uh, sets us on the wrong on the wrong track, uh, and then and then finally, there's also been conversation around: um, Is this something that the board is looking to to be a part of in the sense of um, the the actual uh, the actual request, uh, the actual evaluation? Um, or is that something that the board is looking to, to, to frame more conceptually and then staff um, move forward with that? And so those are, those are kind of the, the things that we're trying to gain clarity so that we know how we're taking um, our, our steps uh, forward. Um, we are ready, uh, well, by we, I mean Mark. Uh, Mark is ready to, if we needed to engage in the conversation uh, in regards to what the difference between an RFP uh, and an RFQ is, uh, we can do that. Uh, we can do that as well. And so those are kind of the, the three the three buckets that that uh, we we'd like to discuss. Shiloni, I want to start. I want to start with this RFP versus RQ piece, and actually ask you a question, Arturo. So you, as superintendent, if we're going to hire a professional a, a professional service, right? So not a construction project, but a professional service that's ongoing as a consultant. What to you makes sense, an RFP or an RFQ? To me, an RFP process um, makes um, the most sense. Uh, and the reason it makes the most sense is because uh, this is not a, um, a new service. Uh, this is not uh, something that um, is is something that we're doing brand new or we're trying to implement or we're trying to, uh, to begin. And so for the most part, uh, we understand what it is uh, that our needs are in terms of um, legal representation. And so uh, following the, the process that we currently have um, makes the most sense. But that being said though, I, I don't, I don't on, on the opposite end of that coin, I don't think that that means that an RFQ process wouldn't serve a, a good, a good, um, a good purpose as well. Hey, Mark, could you explain the difference between the RFQ and the RFP, please? Sure. So, a, a request for qualifications is the definition of an RFQ, and so typically it's the pre-qualification phase of a, of a larger process, but it could also be used as the one and only step in a very simple uh, request for a service. So everyone is right 
in that what what they're saying, right? So it, it is flexible. Um, you can use the qualifications to pick your best candidate and and then move forward. Um, the RFP process in a, in a large process could be started off as an RFQ. You get all the candidates that are that are um, applying and the RFQ limits that. These are the people that are qualified, right? They have the experience needed. And then you use the RFP as kind of a grading scale to, to rate them on different criteria that the district is looking for in, in that service, in this case, legal services. Um, and so you can, you can further you know, refine that. Um, in this process, you know, the district does not need to just pick one, right? You can pick multiple, you can segregate out. You could say, you know what, one, this one legal service looks like their HR um, services are amazing. We want to pick them, but they did not perform really well when it came to facility knowledge. We want to pick this guy. So it is possible to have different firm firms um, selected for different components of legal opinions. Um, and so all that is pro possible if we want to do an RFQ and start start it again. Um, or if you wanted to open the RFP um, responses that we've already received, um, all of that is possible. It is also possible to, after reviewing them and scoring them, um, it is written into the RFP that we have that you can call them in for an interview and listen to um, you know, the, the partners speak and, and that can help you refine your selection process. So nobody is wrong. Everyone has the right definition because they're, they're all kind of flexible. Um, but I, I apologize, I, I, that is the direction I received. So um, you know, if I, and inconvenience the board in any way, I do apologize. I think Yolanda. Yolanda next. Um, so um, I have several questions regarding the RFP and the RFQ. So is there a, um, a process like, which one comes first? If there is first, or do you just do one? You know, my first, my second question also is, what is the protocol that we use at Azusa Unified when we are hiring, because uh, what you said, Mr. Ortega, earlier about opening the envelope and you talked about you know, what process you want to do, what is the actual protocol that we have used in the past when we are hiring legal or, or whomever? Go ahead, Mark. Um, I don't know the process that the district used to hire legal last time. I believe it was through an RFP, but I'm not certain of that. But for all of our um, consultants that we hire with the bond, um, we go through a, an RFP process. And no, you're I, I'm sorry, Mark, but what I meant by that is by, um, from what I recall, even hiring uh, the consultants and so forth, you know, uh, the uh, RFP or the RFQ will come to administration and then mm -hmm. you um, look them okay. over and then you bring recommendations to, uh, you will say we have 10, you bring five or three to the board and let us know what is your rationale why you selected these because you weed them out, I'm sure, because sometimes not everyone, they may give an application doesn't mean that they're qualified. Correct. And that's, uh, right, and I know that's that's what you do. And then um, where the department does that and then uh, uh, the recommendation comes to the board and then we look them over and then we ask questions, you know, why or where they come from or what are their background and so forth. That's what I recall um, our protocol has been all along when we hiring, not even a legal firm, but hiring generally um, consultants or whomever. So most of the consultants, we would go through a process like that where the yes. district would make the selection, we would bring the recommendation at the end. But from what I understand, the, the board did have an increased, um, I guess, hand in the selection of legal services years ago. Uh, from, from what I understand, I might be incorrect. It was prior to me being here. But you also asked what know. is what comes first, the RFQ or an RFP? So the RFQ always comes first. Um, it, 
if, if you're going to have a two-step process, you would do the RFQ and then you would do the RFP, but you can do an, just an RFQ and you can do just an, um, an RFP. Um, you would really only do both if you had a large candidate pool that you wanted to narrow down before you went to the specific proposals. And then Mark, just to add on, just to be super duper clear, uh, the RFP process currently is not just for bond um, uh, bond uh, items. There are other items where we use RFP processes that are not related to the bond. Absolutely. For nutrition services, we use it for um, everything that's over Technology. the limits. Um, yeah. All, we use it all over the place for, for to, any, any large purchase goes through an RFP that isn't, you know, through one of the, the mass buying um, protocols. Yeah. And, and then to double down on, on Mark's comment, um, there, there is no quote unquote right way. Right, it's just the, the the way that that we would like to proceed with this. I'm not sure who was next, if it was Adrian or Gabriela. It's Adrian. So a couple things I'll um, add. One, um, so the only reason why I would say, you know, I, I hear how there are different ways to do this, and so you know, so so generally speaking, there isn't a right way or a wrong way. Um, the only caveat I would add is that to my to my pretty pretty solid recollection. The direction that was given from the board was to do an RFQ, um, and it was it was not to do an RFP. And so, when we're looking at you know right or wrong from that perspective, um, then it was the then then going through an RFP process instead of an RFQ then was a deviation from what what direction was was given. And so, then from that perspective, um, it was the wrong wrong course of action. Um, the other other thing I'll add or or, or say is, um, and this is uh, Yolanda. I know you were asking about. Um, processes that we go go through with our consultants and, and, and other things. And, and that's my understanding as well, that in most situations, we go through a process of, of, uh, of where staff looks at it and brings recommendations our way. But I will, I will remind us even of the process that we just took with um, uh, uh, appointment of, of Arturo as a superintendent. There are, some, there are some kind of services and some situations where we as the board, it's, as I understand it as a freshman board member anyway, where, where we would play a, a, a more prominent role in, in that process as opposed to any other um, appointments or, or, uh, or, or matters of, of employment. And so, um, and I, I you know, would say superintendent is, a, is a, in that category. And I would also you know, suggest that um, legal services are in that category as, as well, that we would play a larger role. Um, and so I, I don't know that I would necessarily look at how we handle consultants with bonds and consultants in other areas to, to, to frame or shape how we would um, hire our legal services. Gabriella. Um, yes, I wanted to, to also uh, convey that the when when this was passed, it was passed as an RFQ, and it was deviated to an RFP. Um, and uh, there was many times where I know I personally uh, I, I wrote an email to the board president and the superintendent, um, asking them, you know, to please change it to what was um, what was. Uh, requested by the board and along those lines as well what was uh, in that board meeting was that uh, board members be the ones to hire the law firm and so um, I, I would like to to ask uh, Madam President to to open it up for the school board members here that are present for us to be able to basically um, restart this process we had no clue that they had um, you know, put out the bids for an RFP, therefore, and it was not by the guide of the request of the majority of the board when it was passed. So therefore, I am asking for this <clears throat> process to start as an RFQ um, to move forward with what the board has decided. And Shiloni. So, um, Gabriel, I just want to make a suggestion um, because I, my, my guess is that the, many of the people who already applied would be the ones applying again. And that is, I mean, I think that maybe just, and also to expedite the process, I, I would want, I would want us to consider, I would want us to consider 
just going with an RFP process. This is not a this is not a legally binding like construction process where we have to follow all these rules and and just open it up again right now for a certain amount of time so that other people can submit proposals and then we could go with the with the with whatever process that we that we decide as the board because I agree with Adrian right I think this is, legal counsel is one group that reports directly to the board and so we should be the ones deciding who legal counsel is. So I just want to make that recommendation rather than starting all over because that will delay and I think it can be much more expedited if we just reopen and use these same same bids and then add some more to them. I, I like your suggestions Janeline. Um I think it is important that we do open it um, and that we have a uh, a, a, a time frame and that we as the board are are notified of when this this open um uh, time frame is um but i would have to agree with you chanelene yeah and then i and then i would just and then i would just add i sorry i forgot to add because it's based on what something that was said last week last meeting that that to me this would be an open process and not invitation only which it sounded like it was the first time around right i think the last time we got legal counsel we didn't do invitation only we just put it out there and those that responded we got i mean we got um the, a lot of the, the reputable firms to apply so I, I would i would think that we already have many of those and so i think there's no harm in just opening it up um i would also like to uh, do a two-step process um you know, if the majority would like to continue with the RFP and then after that, uh, you know, minimize it by an RFQ. I just don't want what's happening is, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mark or Arturo, is that when we go through an RFP process, um, we, you know, by, by law, we have to take the lowest bidder. And at this point right now, since, no? No. Okay. There's there's really very little difference between the RFP and the RFQ on the selection process. Um, so the only formality is that typically there's a rating sheet and you would use that rating sheet as kind of a necessity in the RFP, but the district can choose what is on the rating sheet. And one of those components obviously is price but you can have as many other components that the district feels is um, that are important. So um, the RFP or RFQ process, every single time um, I've seen one, you use the same rating sheet. So there, there's very little difference from what you will see on your end. The difference between the RFQ and the RFP is you will ask for much more specifics to be presented to you in the document that the that they're gonna provide for review. That's the it, biggest difference. The RFQ, right? It, no, the RFP. The RFP will have much more specifics. So we go through the two-step process and um, open it up, um, you know, have a, a, a window frame and open it up publicly and then move on to RFQ. Um, that'd be okay? No, that, that would be backwards. So. Okay, so think about it this way. So that the RFQ would be, tell me what your qualifications are. So who have you worked with? What districts have you served? Um, you know, what, who's in your firm? Very, very kind of essential functions of what makes you qualified to work with us. In RFP, you're going to provide much more detail of how you plan to meet the specifications that we spelled out in the document. What, what will you do to meet this unique population that, that is in Azusa? And Mark, just to again, put, a, put an exclamation uh, on this. Um, when we're talking about the rating, those same exact things can also be part of the rating in terms of sure. references, past experience, right? Th those can all be part of the rating system uh, in terms of even if we went through the RFP process, those are all things that can be part of our rating or your rating or you, the, the evaluation of the actual firms. Correct. So the RFP to respond to is much more work on the legal firms than the RFQ. Adrian? Yeah, so uh, um, first, I. Shilina, I hear you talking about like the process and, and timing, um, and and that that while while I think that that's important, I think um, 
we we don't have to this isn't something that we have to be rushed with uh, in that like and correct can can maybe mark you can speak to this or, or arturo um if if we were to I, I understand we have like expirations on our contracts or whatever with our current legal services if we were to go into a like a, a more extended process with this um we would what does that do as far as our our um legal coverage in the interim and what are our options there so with our current firm that does most of our legal consulting we will go month to month with whatever the new rate structures are and that is what is stated in their contract that expires the end of this month And so we will almost inevitably do that either way because of where we are in the process. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Yes. As a matter of fact, tonight, later on, there is a one such example of that. And Yolanda. Is the, um, the RFP and the RFQ, are they generic or, or um, where, where do they come from? Um, and also, or can something be added or deleted from this RPR to, uh, to fit what we're looking for? Yeah, so I, I made it unique to Azusa to describe the needs of the district. Okay. But yeah, we can, I mean, if you want to do it again, you could customize it, add different questions or, or ask them to highlight different aspects of their firm and in the needs of Azusa. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a customized document that I put together, you know, at at the direction of my superintendent. Do you, do you get it? Do you get it from um, CSBA? Do you get it from the state? Like, wh where does it come from originally? You just create it? Um, so I, I looked at multiple templates that were out there um, mm -hmm. already and, and pulled them together. I looked at one of them that Gabby um, forwarded to Linda and took some of the elements of that one, put it in there. Um, some of the ones, some of the stuff from, um, I think it was Sacramento, um, had, I would say, the majority from that document. So. OK, thank you. I want to uh, just take a quick pause and summarize uh, where I think we are right now. Um, I think that there has been um, a, a suggestion that we reopen the RFP process, um, move uh, beyond invitation uh, and, and publicize in terms of pu uh, publicity and, and publicizing and marketing it um, to try and um, get an effort of getting more interest in um, submitting a proposal uh, for Azusa Unified School District um, is what I'm hearing right now. But again, just for clarity, that that is still taking us through the RFP process, which which I want to make sure that if that's not what we want, right, then we need to we need to make sure that 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 is what we're stating uh, right now, and we're going in a different in a different uh, uh, direction. Um, Because the alternative, of course, would be let's just restart uh, 100 percent and um, you, you know, I'm gonna go through the I'm RFQ. Yeah, I'm going to suggest that we stick to the original plan. I, I you know what it was totally deviated. And you know what if to me, I think, you know, that they, they can reapply it. It's going to be the same, you know, type of process. I think it's important that we as a board um you know stick to what we say and not keep changing it because someone made a mistake um i i don't know would that be a long process arturo do you think i mean we can have this it's just the wording um i looked over the the document and was able to to um just identify like two or three things um but other than that it, it's pretty much the same document the only thing that changes is the qualifications um 
you know, again, a lot of the times when we as a board decide something and something's not done because it's deviated, then we comply. And I really don't want to do that right now. I mean, I know I said that earlier, but I, I feel really strongly about this. Can I, can I ask what, what portion of the RFP other than the, the, the name of it is not being met? I, I don't have necessarily it in front of me. Um, so if, let me bring it up. And maybe if I could answer that, or if, if we could answer that question, then it might help Rhonda? provide clarity. I, I think that um, if, if um, Mr. Robredo says that it's more detailed than an RFQ, why can't we just use the one that we already have? If it's more detailed. Just because we're starting on the wrong foot, I just don't feel okay with it. Um, I, I think I'm wrong. I, I mean, it, the consensus of the board, that's where we need to take, because I know every, all of us may feel different, but I don't know. I, right, I, I'm, been, I'm fine. The consensus was taken in January, and... Um, what we're talking about, like, right now, what we're talking about right now. We need to make sure that, we, again, and again, moving forward with this board, I think it's important that we do not forget that what, you know, what happened in the past, what we've decided on, and then it gets turned around, and then all of a sudden we decide something else. Um, I think it's that we need to be consistent, even though it was since January, and now we're looking at the end of June. Um, I, I just feel very strongly about this. Well, Madam President, maybe you can ask the board, uh, you know, how that's, they feel. I mean, it's like that's a, where I'm moving. Thank you. That's thank exactly. You, going. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. So we know how you feel. Yolanda? Yes. Anything else? Okay. And uh, Sheila? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Adrian. sorry. Yolanda, when you said yes, what, I'm not sure what your yes means. Oh, yes. I, I, I'm saying j just to stick to the process that we're already on the RFP only because when Mark mentioned it has, um, more detail, more detailed information than than the RFQ. Um, I, I would rather have the more detailed information. Uh, again, just because if you did an RFP, would you have to still go to RFQ to get the other information? No. Since they're not the same. That's. Yeah, and just for clarity, just so again, we're we're all thinking the same thing. Um, what I'm hearing is that Jerry's going to ask, are we restarting and going through an RQ process? Um, or are we amending the current process and going back to advertising um, and, and continuing on the, on the path that we are in? Is that correct? Are those, is that where, what we're, well, what, um, what Jerry's going to be asking? Yes, that is exactly what Jerry's going to be asking. <laughs> so which way would you all rather do? I know Sheila Neen, you had suggested the RFP with opening it back up again. Yeah, I was just, I was just trying to find a compromise. I, frankly, I don't really care which one we do. I'm ambivalent. I'm fine okay. either way. Um, and the only thing I would say is if, if, um, if we as the board are going to play, are, are playing a role in this, in the process, but the process has already been started and, and we, and we didn't speak into it, then, then how, how does that, um, so, so let me, let me, maybe let me ask this. This was asked, but I'm not sure that it was clearly clarified. The RFP has already went out there and there are some, you know, bids or whatnot that are in a sealed envelope somewhere. If we were wanting to add a question or three or, you know, whatever to, to the RFP process, what happens to those that are currently in the, that, that envelope, they get sent back and they have to resubmit it and add those additional questions. Oh, yeah, we, our, we can do that. So we can um, amend the RFP. It's stated in there. So we could add um, questions to it. After the fact, we can extend the deadline. We can open it up for, for mo more folks. But just to let you know, I did contact every legal 
every major educational legal firm um, that any uh, anyone had heard of in my group or uh, Linda's group. Okay, and then um, yeah, I guess I guess I'd also want to know what what we what happened last time. We don't we don't have that information at the moment, but you know, in previous instances, have we typically and historically gone with RFPs or RFQs with our, our legal services? That to me would be a huge. Uh, Shilani, do you remember? Can speak to it? Yeah, we've only done it once in my career here. It actually took a long time to do it the first time. Um, to get to that point, to get the board agreeing to that. Um. Um, we did an RFQ, but I think at that point, like we had people working there that felt like that if you were hiring professional services, you did an RFQ. If you were doing like construction or project bidding, you did an RFP. But that was the approach internally that 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 our business office had. So that's how we did that. Um, so, um, but it was, but we did we did that. I do I do just want to. I don't want this to drag on, but I do want to just recommend that we don't think about micromanaging. The questions in the RFP or Q. I mean, I think I think very much so. The 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 decision making about who's selected should be our purview. But I'm not sure we need to delve into deciding what was what goes into that document that gets sent out. Yeah. So, Adrian, do you have a definite one way or the other? Yeah, I guess I, guess I um, with with that said, I, I am with the and with the understanding of us, you know, at the end, it comes to the board to make a a, a decision. Um, I, I'm okay with continuing on the path that we're currently on. Okay, and that that's the majority. So we'll go ahead and go through with the RFP. It sounds like, and does, does that mean, Jerry, that's that's what you want to do? Yes. Okay. Thank that's you. What I will More do. Clarity. Yes. And we'll open it back up again. Yes. <clears throat> okay. What is that period? Of, what is how does that work? What what is that period of time that it's opened up? You you provide direction, and I will make it happen, or I will help make it happen. <laughs> one one thing I heard is that um, having uh, constant uh, communication in terms of where we are in the process, um, when it's being advertised, uh, where it's being advertised. So I have jotted that down and I will make sure that um, that is uh, transparent and that you know exactly where we are in that, in that particular process. And I'd like to say that um, basically, since I've already said that I'm not running again, um, this is going to be you guys as attorney. And so I'm not going to take huge stands other than to what makes sense. If I, could, that, if, so. I could chat, if I could push back on you there a little bit, uh, Jerry, and just, just to say, um, so I know you're not running again, but you're still, you're still on the team and, and still on, exactly. the, on the board up until that date. And so your, your, yes. your, your, your vote and your perspective is still uh, needed and, and valuable. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. But you did, I, I, I'm, I was hoping you understood what I meant by that. But yeah, it's just that's why I'm not trying to shirk off anything. I'm so okay. Now, so we'll move on to consent calendar. Item 10.10.0 uh, 10.1 all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and enacted by the board in one motion in the formatting following the last consent calendar agenda item. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the board, the time the board staff or the public requests specific items to be discussed. If discussion is requested by a board member, that item will be removed from the consent calendar and will be considered separately. The superintendent and staff recommend approval of all consent calendar agenda items. Do I have a motion on the floor? I I'd quote item 10.13. Oh, okay. Please. I'm 10.13. And I'd also like to pull item 10.5. And 10 point, I'm sorry? 10.5. Okay, 10.5 and 10.13. Okay. And do I have a motion? Minus 10.5 and 10.13. <laughs> make a motion to approve. <laughs> Second. Okay. Okay, uh, motion by board member Rodriguez Pena, seconded by board member Greer. And we can go ahead and vote.
And it passes 5-0. Now we will move on to 11.0 or 11.1, which what I would assume would be 10 point, previously 10.5. Approve agreement with California Consulting LLC. Adrian. So um, can, can you, can, can, can somebody speak to this a, a little bit? I guess um, I'm wanting to be, I'm wanting to, to make sure that we're having clear and transparent conversations whenever we have consultants that, that are coming to us. Um, this is $65,000 uh, that's coming out of the um, LCFF. And so can can we speak to this? Um, I, I know, um, Arthur, you and I had a conversation earlier in the week, but I think it would just be valuable um, for, for the entire community and everybody to hear. Sure. Uh, so we have been contracting with uh, California Consulting since uh, 2014, uh, and in that time frame, um, they have been able to secure close to four million dollars uh, in grants uh, for the district. Uh, now that four million dollars is a combination of um, actual um, funds, money, uh, and also a combination of services. Uh, as a result of those uh, awards, uh, be that um, uh, professional development, be that in kind, uh, you know, uh, certain services. And so together, it's, it's again, it, somewhere in the magnitude of $4 million. Uh, some of the big, um, big, big grants uh, that I can speak to uh, they have been instrumental in our uh, California State Preschool um, grants uh, and expansion. Uh, they were instrumental in our uh, Cali uh, application. Uh, currently, right now, uh, they just finished a process uh, with uh, Nutrition Services uh, to um, submit grants uh, for the Gen Youth uh, for COVID-19 Emergency School Nutrition Funding. Uh, which can net us uh, somewhere in the in the the average of about three thousand dollars additional funding uh, towards that. Um, so, again, not again, but so compared, you know, comparatively to uh, to the to the amount of the of the contract, uh, we have seen uh, a tremendous amount of, of benefit, not only in the dollar amount, not only in the services. Uh, but actually in the outcomes um, that, that, that have happened here. Uh, just a point of note, th this, this agreement is not for, uh, for services for quote unquote, the district office. Uh, schools have used this as well. I'm thinking right now of Foothill Middle School uh, who has uh, one of those um, uh, drinking fountains where you can put a bottle, right? To fill up your, your, your water bottle. Uh, that was, again, a, a result in partnership with California Consulting in terms of writing that grant and securing that grant. So you would describe it as um, a pretty incredible ROI um, for the, the money that goes in versus what, what the district gets in return? A definite incredible re uh, return on, uh, on investment for sure. Okay, I, then um, I'd like to motion uh, to, to approve. 11.1. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, motion by board member Greer, seconded by board member Rodriguez Pena. Um, we've had our discussion, so we can go ahead and vote. Gabriella? Okay, 5-0. It passes 5-0, and now we'll move to 11.2, approve addendum number one agreement with Maria Elena Romero Consulting, or construction? Consulting. Yes, I have a question regarding, um, I would like Mr. Arturo or maybe Mr. Barberito, um, the first question is, because uh, I, I don't see it here, but I know that she's pretty much the project manager of the bond measure, um, things that are being done in 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 AUSD. So, I mean, are we on time with our projects and are we on budget? First question, and then second question, if you can please 
explain a little bit about Maria Romero because she's been here since the beginning of this bond. Sure. Um, so for the most part, we have been on track. Um, the only exception to that would be um, our Slauson project, which was held up in DSA. Um, but besides that, all of our projects are within a few months of when they're expected to be completed. Um, you know, and we've brought a few of those change orders for a month here or there to, to be wrapped up. Um, but as, as you alluded to, Maria Elena, uh, con, uh, her firm is not just one person. So she, she brings on a team of folks that helps out in the field. So they are um, supervising at the job sites to make sure that everything is happening for the district. So um, the contractor is on target, um, being able to respond um, to questions that come and, and make sure that those get transferred appropriately to the architect. Um, does the negotiations for the district um, in, in that conversation between the architect um, and, and sometimes with the contractors. Um, her firm also does um, much of the, the, the paperwork that is required. So um, they provide expertise on scheduling of when we should go out for a bond, um, how much we should estimate that we would we would need for stock cost on projects um, and that is a, a different portion of, of the services that she provides so truly like a construction management firm and the cost significantly more and she provides all those services as a consultant and i can answer any more specific questions just um a couple questions and you touched on it when, when you mentioned soft costs. Um, so a few board meetings ago, we, we had a conversation where, where, where we looked at the uh, capital facilities and we saw a list of, um, you know, it was like the pyramid and we had the list of potential projects that were in the pipeline. And we talked about how there, there you know, we are projecting that there are monies to complete all of those projects that we saw in the, in the pipeline. Granted that the, that the, the, the board chooses to to you know execute on each of those projects with that being said I'm, I'm seeing that there are like I, I did not add up the numbers but there are you know potentially millions of dollars here I mean multi that are here in the different consulting uh, um, contracts that are here does that add to and is that a, is that above and beyond the the cost of those projects or are these numbers worked into those those estimates and those projections that we saw because if if they if, if these are in addition to then I don't see how the math um, works out. Yeah, so on that pyramid one that we bring back um, a few times a year, the soft costs are included in the estimates. And whenever we presented information to the board and the soft costs were not um, because the range was, was too large, we've called that out explicitly to say these are the construction costs, um, the estimate of soft cost is in the range of 15 to 30 percent um, so that way you can really delineate um, when we've included and when we haven't but your specific uh, pyramid one that we bring back on a regular basis that it always includes the, the soft cost and specifically these soft costs that come back and like these contracts that come back annually correct and and this these amounts that you see for all of these does not mean that that's how much we're going to pay. Um, this is a maximum, so it will not exceed. And, and in some cases, you'll see we spent less than a quarter of them out. Some cases we spent, you know, a hundred percent of them out. So um, it all depends on what gets moved and how quickly we move on projects, and as to how much we will will spend. And um, within each project we're monitoring how much those soft costs are. Um, and so this is kind of the big umbrella of monitoring each one of our consultants to make sure they don't go over that number as well. So there's multiple steps to make sure that um, spending is monitored closely. Got it, thank you. 
So I it, make the motion to, oh, if there's no more questions, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just gonna ask if the I like, Yes, I make a motion to approve, um, what is the number again it changed? I'm sorry, it changed 11. to- 11.2. Huh? 11.2. 11. 11. 11.2, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, and I second the motion. Okay, motion by board member Rodriguez Pinion, second by board member Greer. Um, we've had discussion, so let's vote. Um, my my browser disappeared, so I'm not voting. Okay, well we can hand vote. Yeah. Hold on, All let right. me see. No, I got it. I got it. Oh, there, okay. It back. All right, cool. And it is uh, four to one. Okay, and it passes. So now we'll go on to. Uh, 12.0 business and finance, 12.1 ratify approved change order number three, Gladstone Street parking lot. Can we have that explained? Sure. So this is a deductive change order in the amount of 30, almost 36,000 for the unused allowance. So it, there is always a built-in allowance for un, unknown um, things that may come up and we did not use nearly 36,000 of it. Okay, do I have a motion to approve? I move Make to approve. Motion. Okay. Second. A motion by Adrian Greer, seconded by board member Rodriguez Pena. And any discussion? Okay, let's vote. It passes 5-0. And now we will move on to uh, item 12.2, approve notice of completion for Gladstone Street parking lot. Uh, do I have a motion on the floor? I move to approve 12.2. Okay. I'm gonna give that one to Rhonda. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be by board member Rodriguez, <laughs> seconded by board member Greer. Any any conversation? Good. I'll be faster next time. Okay. okay. And get you one of those little staple <laughs> buttons. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let family feud. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and it passes 5-0. And then we will move to 12.3, approved contract agreement with network, network support group. Motion to approve, 12.3. <laughs> Motion by board member Greer. Oh <laughs> Seconded by board member Pena. Let them have it. All right, any, <laughs> any discussion? All righty, well, we'll go ahead and vote. Passes 5-0, move on to? Motion to approve, 12.4. 12.4, approved memorandum of understanding between Azusa Unified School District and Charter Oak, Duarte, and Monrovia Unified School Districts for the K-12 Strong Workforce Program, <laughs> motioned by Board Member Arianas. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Board Member Greer. Any discussion? Can you please explain that, um, I guess, Mr. Barrito or whomever, sorry. I have uh, invited uh, Frank Chang uh, to, okay. um, yes. to talk about this uh, strong workforce program. Okay. Frank, you're on mute. Oh, 
Okay, good evening, board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some um, insight in regards to the K-12 Strong Law Force Program. Um, we have an MOU with um, the Foothill Consortium Districts, which includes um, Charter Oak, Duarte, and Monrovia with ourselves as the lead fiscal agent. And we were able to, through the collaborative effort of this Foothill Consortium, secure a $900,000 grant um, of which Azusa Unified will see 261,000 after um, shared costs that include um, consultants as well as other um, costs that the um, Foothill Consortium will be sharing. Uh, this allows us um, to move forward with a lot of our CTE programs as well as to continue dual enrollment opportunities with Citrus um, specifically in the CTE world and um, further uh, partnerships with local businesses to offer internships for our students. Um, and that is the gist of the K-12 Strong Workforce Program. Um, just out of curiosity, do, does, does AUSD receive any like additional revenue as being the, the, the lead or is, it, is that just a voluntary uh, service? We do have um, the indirect cost that goes to us, um, and that I believe will be somewhere around 4.7 to 5% next year. Um, so we do have the indirect cost, um, but other than that, um, we do not have any additional benefits. Okay, any other questions? Right. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and vote. Okay, passes for five zero. And then we will move on to the last uh, 12.5 approved memorandum of understanding between Azusa Unified School District and Simply Divine. Do I have a motion on the floor? Motion to approve 12.5. Okay, Second. motion by board member Ariana, seconded by board member Greer. And discussion? Questions, comments? Okay, uh, then we can go ahead and vote. And it passes. <laughs> okay, and at this point, I'm going to head, go ahead and close the open session part of our meeting at 9.50 and- um, Yolanda has a question. Oh, Yolanda, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to say since Mark mentioned that this was his last meeting, I wasn't aware of that, but I want to thank him for his service as our CBO. You know, at first, honestly, you know, oh, well, it's not a secret, but I did not vote for him <laughs> because I didn't really think he could do the job, but he proved me. He proved me wrong and you know, he did a great job and I'm also sorry to see him leave. So thank you, Mark, for everything. Yeah, and <laughs> as we're doing that same, uh, just just grateful for you, Mark. Um, uh, uh, just your, your expertise and, 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 and the, the, the degree to which um, you, you have ex explained things to me. We, we, we've spent many a minutes on phone calls looking at uh, some, some of those details. And so um, just, just grateful for that and, um, you know, Wish you nothing but uh, but but blessings and uh, uh, as you move on to your next uh, endeavor and thank you for for everything um, that you've done for um, AUSD. Anybody else want to? Mark, congratulations in your new endeavor. Uh, thank you for the time that you've given Asusa, and thank you for leaving the door open for us to be able to give you a call since you you will be our neighbor. Um, since you will be our neighbor, what 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 school district is this? I didn't want to say it, but Covina. It's public. <laughs> Covina Valley. We know where you're going, Mark. Don't worry. We know where you're <laughs> we no secret. Hey, anybody else? Thank you, Mark. And Thank you, guys. Hey. Mark, I, I have to. Azusa Unified is losing Mr. Dreamy. Is that okay. what happened? <laughs> Good luck with what you gotta do. <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, yeah. we'll go 
ahead and go back into closed session. All right. Yeah, Megan told me all about you. My neighbor, Megan Pendergast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna... Are we still live, Mark? Yes. Let me. Can we stop oh, no. recording, please? <laughs>